If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1. A Crueler Way of Being When everyone asks themselves if they would sell their soul to the devil to fulfill their desires, what exactly is your answer? I would be willing to do whatever it takes to achieve my goals. In the fabric of human existence, threads of complexity and contradiction intertwine. Humans, inherently soulless beings by nature, demonstrate their innate capacity for empathy and creativity, although this often seems like a convenient facade that hides their true essence of wickedness. Wars are just a drop in the sea of evil, manipulation, and self-gain. Since the dawn of civilization, humans have proven to be tireless destroyers of their own environment. The unrestrained exploitation of natural resources, relentless deforestation and indiscriminate pollution of the air and water are just some of the ways they ruthlessly ravage the planet. Climate change, a direct consequence of their unrestrained selfishness, reflects their lack of scruples when making decisions. Human history is a bloody record of conflict and violence. Wars, ideological struggles, and territorial disputes have bathed history in blood, and they will continue to do so for many more years. Billions of lives have been lost in the maelstrom of cruel and selfish motivations, and human suffering appears to be the only notable legacy in their historical journey. Social inequality is another aspect of the inherent perversity of humans. Despite futile attempts to achieve gender equality and civil rights, the gap between the haves and the have-nots continues to widen everywhere. The unfair distribution of resources and opportunities is a direct manifestation of their insatiable greed. Selfishness, that immutable human trait, is always present. Exploitation of others and corruption are their daily bread. Empathy toward those in disadvantaged situations is virtually non-existent in a society where greed and cruelty are the dominant values. If you ever witness any empathy for others, it means that there are always ulterior motives behind every kindness tainted with manipulation. In a world saturated with information and knowledge, ignorance and denial are unfortunately commonplace. The acceptance of false beliefs and the denial of established scientific facts are just examples of the innate wickedness of humans. Yes, as everyone may have imagined, I have a serious problem when it comes to talking about my own species. You might think I'm just a clown trying to get attention, but aren't we all quite hypocritical? While some cry for the ghouls, have they ever considered that the human journey and its sins are no worse than this? In this desolate landscape, sparks of hope are little more than illusions. Humans seldom change, and when they do, it's often for selfish, dark reasons, to seek forgiveness or to clean their tarnished image exposed to the world. All humans live in a world where routine and monotony stand as the pillars supporting everyone's life. A young man with a deep gaze and few words began to question the meaning of his own existence. Kenzo Yashimura, a seemingly quiet boy on the outside, who found himself trapped in a society determined to mold him in its own image. However, Kenzo was determined to resist because he was not human. From a young age, Kenzo realized that his place in the world was as uncertain as that of a stranger in a foreign land. The society around him moved forward relentlessly, without taking a moment to reflect on the consequences of its actions. Kenzo, a ghoul in a world of humans, observed with cold, calculating eyes every hypocritical action hidden under the guise of those supposedly causing chaos, aware of the shallowness of the everyday life that surrounded him. Kenzo's world was a stage where cruelty and indifference loomed large. His quest for humanity faced him with a cruel paradox, how could he seek something he himself lacked? Surrounded by humans who were both victims and perpetrators of injustice and cruelty, Kenzo became a silent witness to life's contradictions. Kenzo's philosophy began to take shape as he grew up in his ruthless world. He recognized that everyone yearned for genuine connection and purpose beyond survival, but how could he find it in a world that forced him into a predetermined mold? Despite his calm appearance, Kenzo was tormented by the anger that burned within him. This anger knew no bounds and was directed toward those he considered his enemies, those who perpetuated injustice and cruelty. It was a disturbing duality, the quest for humanity and the impulse of brutality intertwined within him. In his darkest moments, Kenzo found an escape in writing. His thoughts flowed in ink and paper, a torrent of contained emotions that delved into the depths of his soul. Through his words, he questioned the meaning of violence in a world that pretended to embrace forgiveness and understanding. But Kenzo didn't limit himself to being a spectator of his own life. He decided that the search for humanity must begin from within. Through introspection and self-reflection, he started to unravel the roots of his anger and brutality. He understood that only by accepting his own darkness could he aspire to the light he so deeply longed for. It was then that he founded an organization called the Crow of Three Eyes, a group of ruthless ghouls that provided the delicious sustenance all ghouls needed to survive. It wasn't a large organization 
but its profits could rival those of major drug cartels if taken seriously. At that moment, Kenzo realized that to keep his organization protected, he needed strong warriors committed to a unified vision where humans would be mere mirrors of ghouls. Dealing with drug traffickers was quite straightforward, there was no need to be a ghoul to do business with them, but they certainly didn't care as long as the money was attractive to all. As he progressed on his journey, Kenzo encountered other wandering ghouls who shared his desire to find meaning in a ruthless world. Together, they would have to survive, and each person adhered to strict rules that must be followed to stay alive. Kenzo's quest was not just a personal struggle, his fight was possibly reflected in the way he was raised, but he knew that this method had many cracks, as it was a stability as fragile as ink. And so began the story of Kenzo, a ghoul in search of what made humanity true and meaningful. This is just the beginning of a bloody path that could mean a change for society as it's known. This is Kenzo's story, where he will finally bring order to the world. Kenzo Yashimura, currently 22 years old, is the male offspring of the ghoul of SSS class best known as Kyuzen Yashimura. Due to special circumstances, he ended up being adopted and spent his early years with a man who was not his biological father, but that was always something he kept in mind. His growth was always a bit slow in adapting to the people around him, he often fought at school and felt different from others for reasons he didn't understand. But one day, he realized he was a ghoul, a man-eating monster that was announced every day on television and hunted to death by humans. He didn't know how he ended up being human, but after investigating, he found out that perhaps his parents were ghouls just like him, and somehow his ghoul cells had been dormant until now as he was maturing. In the same way, he ended up being a typical parasite without value, one that could be killed at any moment. It's no wonder that before that, his life felt trapped in a metal box. But he wanted to live and achieve greatness in some way. He knew that the ghouls were losing the war, and as human weaponry continued to increase, ghouls would be exterminated. He didn't want to die like a lab rat, he didn't want to be exterminated like a stray dog, and he knew he wasn't any different from humans who feared for their lives but did the same as ghouls. Where did ghouls come from? Kenzo was intelligent enough to know that ghouls possibly originated from humans practicing cannibalism in ancient times. Cannibalism is the act or practice of feeding on members of one's own species. Cannibalism can occur among members of many species, although it is commonly associated with anthropophagy when humans consume their own kind. So, do humans fear ghouls for their lack of manners and scruples when it comes to eating? If that's a problem, then he would solve it. He would create a business strong and large enough for food to reach the table. He needed to be strong to survive, he had to be, so that no one would bother him. And he was certainly fascinated by being on the side of ghouls who were like headless dogs waiting to be killed. They needed a leader, perhaps he would become something similar to that. But what Kenzo would seek from now on is a future free of plagues, where both humans would have to accept their mistakes, and ghouls would seek a clean way to survive. As he remembered the memories of his younger self, they flooded his dreams. He remembered those bloody nights of control and struggles. He wasn't strong, he had a powerful Kagun, but he was still weak and needed help from other ghouls whom he personally taught how to feed without being detected. Soon, his association, a company full of education and zero violence towards noisy humans, began to slowly take shape. The first years of creating his organization, the Crow of Three Eyes, were tough, but after being on the streets, they reached the highest echelons. Very soon, we will teach humans that they should respect us too. They think they might be winning but they don't know what awaits them. Kenzo murmured as he opened his eyes and looked at the familiar ceiling above his head. Chapter 2, Understanding the Meaning of That Strength District 20 In the beautiful Antioco Cafe, Kenzo sat at the counter, absent-mindedly cleaning cups with an expressionless look. Kenzo, it's time to work. Cheer up! Said the cafe manager, looking at the young man not too far away, whose face bore a palpable loneliness, slowly cracking his inner self. Manager. I'm better than ever. Why do you assume I'm not okay just because I'm silent? Kenzo asked without looking up, his eyes focused on cleaning the cup in his hand the whole time. You went out again at night, didn't you? When things don't go well emotionally, you try to ease your anger outside. This time it took you much longer than usual since you came back past two in the morning. Did you go back to that place? Manager Yashimura wasn't angry at Kenzo's uninterested response who had stopped cleaning. It doesn't matter if I went to that place. He knows perfectly well what I think and what anyone would think, knowing my stance on it. I'd much rather have ended it. Kenzo's calm voice rose in volume upon hearing those questions. 
Seeing Kenzo's attitude, as he bottled up his anger within himself, Manager Yashimura shook his head with a certain helplessness. He is the owner of this café, his full name is Kuzan Yashimura, and the apathetic young man was his son from whom he had been separated for many years. To be more direct, he had abandoned him because he didn't have time to take care of him, and for many more complicated reasons to explain in a few words. Years ago, Kuzan Yashimura, like most ghouls seeking power and survival, cannibalized ghouls and humans alike, even isolating himself from his fellow ghouls to do whatever it took to live. Then, his abnormal strength soon caught the attention of the organization V, who heard about an abnormally strong ghoul named Kuzan. In his youth, Kuzan Yashimura decided to cooperate with these ghouls and joined the organization to serve as their cleaner, much like a literal cleaner, responsible for eliminating hostile forces to the organization or those who disrupted the world even ghouls who were just trying to survive. His existence as a ghoul bothered him, seeing himself as a curse that killed others in order to stay alive. Although at that time, Yashimura had sorted out the issues in his life, he still felt very alone, and the organization hadn't become a place for him. After meeting Yukina, his personality underwent a favorable change. He began to slowly open his heart to her, and ultimately, he came to love her immensely. It was through his relationship with Yukina that Yashimura decided to create Antiaku and pursue his goal of helping those with a similar past and other ghouls or humans in need. During that time, he learned that his wife was pregnant with twins, but he knew perfectly well that a human couldn't bear a child due to the fact that, in most cases, they would be stillborn due to lack of nourishment. When he coldly shared these words with his wife, Yukina, he thought she would give up on the idea of becoming parents. However, there was a single way for their baby's lives to be saved and it was at that moment that Yukina started consuming human flesh to provide the necessary nutrients for her children to be born. Yashimura knew that there was still a chance of not succeeding. But against all odds, a miracle happened, and she gave birth to their beautiful twins, which was extremely rare among ghouls. However, as if this weren't surprising enough, the boy was born completely human. The birth of twins, one girl and one boy, remains a very miraculous case. A half-ghoul girl and a completely normal human boy. The girl's name is Ito, and the boy's name is Kenzo. In other words, the name Kenzo was chosen by Kuzan himself, who, in other words, was his father, but due to many circumstances, Kenzo didn't consider him as a father. But going back to the past, Kuzan found Yukina's diary where he discovered that she was a reporter seeking information about V, and the organization, on their side, discovered the relationship between Kuzan and Yukina. They forced Kuzan to make a decision, kill Yukina, or die together. In an isolated place, Kuzan chose to flee with Yukina, but she was killed right before his eyes. So, in the end, he escaped with his twin children, Ito and Kenzo. Ito was entrusted to Noro, who was known as Noroi back then when she was a child. Kuzan could only do that because it was the only way to protect her properly. But the less concerning issue was Kenzo's, as at that time, he was considered a regular human. So, Kuzan finally decided to give Kenzo to an ordinary old man to raise him, and he continued to run alone. When this ordinary old man picked up Kenzo as a baby, Kuzan only left him a notebook. Unfortunately, the old man who raised Kenzo was illiterate and eventually called the baby by his name. Yes, during the first ten years of his life, he was human. But everything changed when the stimulus in a life-or-death situation awakened something within him, something that was hidden deep within. When he discovered that he was a ghoul, there were certain issues at the beginning regarding how to control his power, which was extremely difficult to keep under control. During that time, he was raised by the old man, and the old man never realized what he was. He never knew, and for Kenzo, it was much better that way because that was the only way to move forward. Most of his time was spent training his abilities. He was good at it because he was much more adaptable than others and could quickly adapt to any situation. He soon created an organization called the Three-Eyed Crows. Its primary role in creating this group of ghouls was to find a way to protect himself and others from humans. His knowledge was extensive, and he knew perfectly well that they were strong now, but that could change in the future because humans are geniuses in warfare. That's why they have always been the winners in ancient times when they faced beasts much more brutal than a ghoul. Ghouls were nothing new, just beasts that hunted among human civilization and would soon be hunted in their place. But Kenzo knew something very important, and that was that the only way to escape was with power which could only be obtained with money and good connections. That's why he soon recruited decent ghouls whom he ordered not to kill because that was the key to not exposing themselves to capture. For that same reason, they needed the help of someone who could feed them. 
This issue was easy to address for Kenzo, the easiest way to obtain human flesh was through traffickers who never lacked corpses to dispose of. What's the best way to get rid of a corpse than to deliver it to the ghouls for consumption? For money, Kenzo had to resort to unethical methods at first, but that was only until he found sponsors. How did he do this? When fears arise that everyone is afraid of, many people do everything they can to protect themselves, including extremely wealthy businessmen who fear for their lives. For them, Kenzo offered a protection program in exchange for cash. These businessmen were initially distrustful, but after clever ways to gain their trust, several business agreements were established. Kenzo thought a lot about it and believed he would fail in his first attempt, but surprisingly, that was not the case, so his initial problems decreased. The first client was hard to get, but soon more people were interested in having ghouls trained by Kenzo's company as bodyguards. When you have money, all you need is an ingenious mind to move in the shadows without humans noticing, much like drugs but instead of moving white powder, they were moving human flesh. Everything was going perfectly, Kenzo's organization, which focused on providing food in exchange for money and training ghouls who couldn't defend themselves, began to increase in numbers, and after several years, it managed to establish itself permanently in District 20. But while he mostly focused his time on his organization, he completely neglected his adoptive father, who died due to his advanced age. Kenzo was not a person who liked to delve into the lives of others, but somehow he knew that the old man who cared for him had lost his family a month before Kenzo arrived at his doorstep. When the old man died, Kenzo was only 15, and at that very moment, Kyuzen Yashimura appeared before him again. For this man who was his father, Kenzo didn't have much to say. Inside him, there was neither hatred nor guilt, just pity. At that moment, he realized that strength was much more important than he had considered, which is why he understood that he had to be strong, and those who followed him had to be much more lethal. However, still being young, Kenzo didn't understand his true father's reasons for leaving him in a stranger's house when he was perfectly fine. Kenzo looked at the cup in his hand and murmured, I can't understand you, Kyuzen. You have great power, but you can't protect your loved ones. You should have thought about it when you fell in love with my mother. You and I are monsters, but you still don't need to know it. At this point, Kenzo knew his father's identity, but his father still didn't know he was a ghoul. Kyuzen might have suspected it but he never dared to ask, perhaps out of fear or some sense of guilt at realizing he had been wrong more than he thought. I told you that I take care of the old man's company. He left everything in my name, so even though my presence is not necessary, I have to go once a week to make sure there are no problems. Kenzo didn't know why he was upset, but every time he looked at his father Kyuzen, he felt a deep sense of sadness. Why is this old man who abandoned me so sad? I should be the one who's sad. I should cry and blame you for abandoning me. You have no idea how many times I thought you abandoned me because I was a monster. You have no idea what I had to go through to control my own power. Maybe you'll never know, and that's fine for both of us. For the first time, Kenzo encountered someone he couldn't understand. His heightened senses of perception were not enough to comprehend what had happened to his father Kyuzen, let alone uncover the true story behind his birth. He had investigated, and ghouls are born as ghouls there is no record of them becoming ghouls after birth. So, he shouldn't blame his father in this regard. Hey, Kenzo. Koma NG couldn't help but speak to stop him, but a hand touched his shoulder, and Irimi Kaya shook her head. Father and son had always had this discussion every time the day they started living in this cafe approached. Koma NG looked at Irimi Kaya in confusion and then turned his gaze to manager Yashimura. I'm sorry, they've made you uncomfortable again, I suppose it'll be this way for a while. Manager Yashimura said with a slight expressionless smile. But Manager Yashimura, we're talking about your son, are you going to let him continue like this? Koma NG was more upset than usual. Hearing this, Manager Yashimura fell silent. Kenzo was his son, but he was a human like his mother. If he thinks about it, it would be too unfair to reveal the whole truth to him because he didn't want to burden his son's conscience. As a father, he's a ghoul, which can be difficult for any normal human to accept. And since Kenzo is currently the only relative by his side, he can only choose to be as tolerant and understanding of his feelings as possible. Don't say a word. Irimi Kaya shook her head as she arranged the cups that Kenzo had cleaned. I, the famous monkey, will educate Kenzo properly and give him a few kicks to make him behave. Stop talking nonsense, this doesn't concern us. Irimi Kaya warned the loud coma that now wasn't the time. 
When Koma looked at the silent manager Yashimura, he understood that he should stop right now. Haha. <laughs> manager Yashimura, I'm sorry for intruding. Oh, it's okay. Anyway, I wouldn't expect that kid to be of much help in the cafe. Since he's tired, he should rest. Kyuzen Yashimura didn't mind and smiled a little. I'm back. At that moment, a voice rang out, and a girl with slightly short hair entered the old cafe. Oh, you're here, Tuka. How did the shopping go this time? Manager Yashimura asked with a smile when he saw the girl come in through the door. Well, all the items on the list were successfully purchased. By the way, where's Kenzo? Tuka put down the objects in her hands, looked around the place where Kenzo usually was, and couldn't find him anywhere. That boy is still too temperamental. Koma Enji felt a sharp pinch on his back, and his disbelieving eyes turned towards the assertive woman Irimi Kaya. He went back to his room to sleep. Irimi Kaya responded swiftly with an indifferent look. Shaking his head, Koma Enji pointed upstairs. What's he doing this time? That guy has been going out every night recently and doesn't come back until after two in the morning. He can't go on like this, I'll call him. Tuka heard the words, frowned, and went to look for Kenzo. Oh. After Koma Enji saw this, he shrugged at the store manager. The store manager still didn't mind, he knew Kenzo was getting increasingly confused and would leave him in peace for a while until he decided to approach him. Chapter 3, The Blood Ghoul At this moment, Kenzo was lying on his bed in his room, holding his cell phone while answering some messages. Take care of delivering the materials today, the situation has been quite turbulent lately, so you must stay calm. Yes. After giving some orders, he didn't know exactly where to go next after coming to this place. He was very different from other young people his age. He attended school when he wanted to and skipped classes when he thought it unnecessary to go. Typically, he caused trouble at school, which is why he repeated several years. Many years had passed since he left high school, so now he believed it was unnecessary to give it another try since he was already 22 years old and had more important plans. He needed to take care of his organization and recruitment. Not everyone passed the test unless he accepted them. Not everyone had the qualities to judge the good from the bad roots. If he allowed a bad plant into his beautiful garden, the infection would spread throughout his domain, and he couldn't allow that. His monopoly in District 20 was sustainable. He had control over crematories where bodies arrived daily, as well as the areas where people typically took their own lives. He created websites to help those who had suffered much in life to end their lives, and in turn, he bought the corpses from traffickers who occasionally asked for jobs they couldn't complete themselves. After the death of his adoptive father, he used his meat company to distribute human flesh and launder money effortlessly, where he wouldn't face any problems. Most of the workers had been replaced, but some were still simple humans. The organization of the Three-Eyed Crows was straightforward. They didn't harm humans, and they didn't start fights that weren't worthwhile. Revealing their strength was a death sentence, so the smartest way to act was to control the ghouls and keep the enemy away from District 20. As a non-hostile organization, Kuzan, who controlled District 20, allowed the Three-Eyed Crows to operate with the deal of providing him human flesh at a modest price. If Kenzo provided it for free at that time, suspicions about his true purpose would arise, which would be a significant problem. The recruitment date is approaching. I should be there for that. Kenzo knew it was necessary to increase the numbers of his subordinates, but that was the problem because the larger it became, the more suspicions there would be about what was happening in this place. Knock knock. Knock knock. At that moment, someone knocked on the door. I already told you I'm too tired to work today, leave me alone, Kenzo said without getting up from his bed when he heard the knocks on the door. However, as soon as his words sounded, Tuka entered from the other side of the door. Hey! Don't you recognize my voice? Kenzo was about to say something when he saw Tuka's figure entering, so he immediately turned off his cell phone in his hand and put it in his pocket. At eh. Tuka frowned, knowing that Kenzo must have been looking at disturbing and mentally unhealthy things. Why did you come into my room again? Kenzo said in a cold and highly indifferent tone, looking at the girl who was beside him. How long are you going to lie down in your room? If you continue like this, Manager Yashimura will worry a lot, you know. Tuka said, hands on her hips and a serious face. I don't care about that. Kenzo remained lying down while closing his eyes. You. Get up now. Tuka said, taking a step forward and forcibly lifting Kenzo. 
stop being so stubborn and get out of here. In no time, a fight between two mad individuals erupted in the room, which continued for some time before Kenzo, who didn't want to mess up the entire room, stopped. Besides, he was sure that everyone knew he was human, although this wasn't the case. Of course, Kenzo had no intention of revealing that he was a ghoul, not for now, as his identity as the Crow Master would be quickly exposed, and Kuzan could pose many problems for his future plans in this place. What would he gain even if the people in this cafe knew? Only pity, of course, many unnecessary questions, and in the worst case, he would get involved in difficult situations with his mysterious business. So, after a small fight, Kenzo let Tuka, who was determined to make him and her father Kuzan get along, win. She had been trying for five years. A few minutes later, Kenzo reluctantly put on his work clothes. It seems our dear Tuka has a way to redirect Kenzo. Koma NG couldn't help but silently congratulate Tuka. Speaking of which, Tuka and Kenzo have known each other since they were very young, and their age difference can be three to four years. However, due to Kenzo's circumstances of constantly repeating school years, they even managed to go to high school together, so their relationship is relatively good. He was smart enough to understand that Tuka behaves this way, very shy and cold with strangers, but extremely sincere and careful with acquaintances. Kenzo labeled Tuka's profile as cold, reserved, and even hostile, but transforming into someone warm, sensitive, and friendly on occasion. All the symptoms of that so-called Sundara, how chilling. Kenzo thought as he walked to his workstation while recalling what he knew about Tuka. She hates CCG investigators, although she is hostile to humans. She is very kind when dealing with her human friends. However, not even Kenzo has spare time to try to find out if this behavior was just something she did to fit into the society that every ghoul wanted to belong to. Hey, you brat, what would you like to drink? At that moment, Kenzo was taking an order from a customer. The boy, around 18 years old, looked at Kenzo, who had the appearance of a man who only knew how to seek trouble. To others, Kenzo isn't ugly, he has small, sad looking eyes uncombed black hair, thin eyebrows and a scar on the right side of his mouth. His tall, muscular body couldn't be concealed, so normally anyone would be frightened if he stared at them for a few seconds. I... I want a cup of coffee. The customer looked at the fierce man in front of him, initially surprised and stammered when placing his order. Bam! After Tuka saw it, she quickly led Kenzo aside. What was this guy trying to do? Scare away customers again? Although he didn't do anything, she knew his unfriendly attitude scared normal people. Hey, honey, aren't you supposed to be working? We need to earn enough money to get married once and for all, I think we're made for each other. Kenzo, who had the upper hand this time, began to take revenge for being dragged out of bed when he didn't want to move. Tuka squeezed the tray in her hands so hard that it began to bend, while maintaining her calm expression and saying in a friendly tone, I'm, so sorry. He has trouble communicating with people. What would you like to drink? Trouble communicating. Kenzo wondered as he returned to the cafe's bar. But at that moment, a slender yet strong hand grabbed him by the arm, and Tuka, who had suddenly appeared, took him to the back of the cafe and asked in a cold tone, Hey, brainless gorilla, do you want to ruin this place with your terrible customer service? Looking at Tuka's slender body so close to him, Kenzo brought his face closer to hers and whispered, Hey, Tuka. We're of marriageable age. There's no better marriage than a young one with a lot of energy. If you can't find a good man, I'm always willing to get married whenever you want. Tuka wasn't bothered by Kenzo's sarcastic words, his attitude had drastic turns, so she had gotten used to it. Instead, she asked, don't you plan on changing that attitude? Nobody will ever understand who you really are if you don't change a bit. But you understand me, right? Kenzo looked into Tuka's eyes and his attitude returned to normal. He gave a short sigh while ruffling the girl's head in front of him and said, Besides, I already told you I wasn't in the mood to work right now. That's it. Brushing off Tuka, Kenzo started to take off his top without caring that he was being observed by a woman. He wasn't so childish as to be embarrassed by something like this. Are you going out again? Seeing Kenzo change his clothes, Tuka asked with suspicion. I'm just going for a walk. You've accompanied me on occasion, and in case you're worried, I don't have a girlfriend out there. If I ever choose someone, you'll be my first choice. Am I romantic enough? Kenzo asked as he turned around and walked straight to the door. Just as Tuka was about to follow him, 
Yashimura appeared in front of her to stop her. Manager, he took a turn to look at the store manager. Let him go, don't worry, said manager Yashimura, not saying anything more. The current District 20 can be considered a safe zone. Although there are ghouls that hunt at night, this situation is very rare, with the night crows hunting ghouls not affiliated with the owl organization in Antioku. As for Kenso, the reason he went out was to hunt a ghoul who had been under surveillance for the last two days by his night crows. His presence wasn't necessary for this type of operation, but he accepted this elimination mission because he had been losing control of his anger lately. There are different ways to detect an active ghoul in District 20. Two types of ghouls came to this place. The first were those seeking refuge and joined either Antiaku or the Owl Organization of the Three Eyes. As for the second type, these were unrestrained ghouls who only sought to establish a domain for hunting. This happened frequently because it was known that District 20 was one of the weaker ones. For this reason, ghouls who considered themselves somewhat strong decided to come to this place to hunt. However, there are only two outcomes for these ghouls, join the crows or get eaten by them. Antiaku typically doesn't directly involve themselves with these ghouls, but they do provide warnings. Still, their intelligence isn't sufficient to maintain control over the entire district. This is why Antioch formed an alliance with the Owl Organization of the Three Eyes and granted them the authority to act in such situations. That's why today, unbeknownst to everyone, the Crow Master, who is Kenzo, will move to neutralize or recruit the threat. Hunting is one of his favorite things to do. Unfortunately, living with his father, who was very strong, prevented him from acting frequently. A single mistake and he would be discovered, which would be quite troublesome to face. All this drama makes me sick. Kenzo muttered as he walked through the darkness. Throughout all these years, Kenzo has had a reason to create his organization and protect himself from both humans and other ghouls. Being a curious ghoul regarding his family, he had been investigating and soon found the existence of the V organization. While he was indeed an orphan, he could infer that his mother had been killed by that organization. His father, Kyuzen Yashimura, obviously had the ability to kill all the ghouls pursuing him, but he allowed his mother to die due to something he knows nothing about. So, while Kenzo can't say he hates his father, he also can't say he has a good opinion of him. That's strange. At that moment, a young man wearing a baseball cap frowned. He seemed to realize he was being followed but couldn't see who was following him. The man in the baseball cap had just left the old cafe, and he was naturally the ghoul who was Kenzo's target. Don't turn around, I'm right behind you. At that moment, a voice came from behind the man in the cap. Thud. The man suddenly turned around and struck the person following him with all his might. This blow was easily received as Kenzo approached. You are. Wait, wait, who the hell are you? The man initially thought he was dealing with some enemies who had found him, but he soon realized that it wasn't the case. Well, yes, this place is quite remote, and now you're my prey. Kenzo, who was gripping the ghoul's hand, began to squeeze it slowly. Crack. Arg. You son of a... The man in the baseball cap didn't finish his sentence. His eyes suddenly changed color, and he attacked Kenzo. That's right, this is my prey. You must resist to make this interesting. The man in the baseball cap swiftly transformed into a being known to all as a ghoul. That's how it should be. Kenzo remained still, not moving a muscle. But as he raised his right hand, a drop of blood formed very slowly. After moving his finger, the drop shot forward at high speed, much like a bullet. Boom. Kenzo's cold voice echoed from the shadows as he walked toward the pile of debris where the defeated ghoul lay. A great A ghoul, but I think you only know how to eat and sleep. After dodging the initial attack, Kenzo's voice sounded lightly. What? What did you just do? The man rose with a large hole in his right chest looking in disbelief at the gaping wound. How is this possible? He was certain the person in front of him was a human, but not only did he dodge the initial attack, he also counterattacked with something like blood. Even a ghoul investigator, without their quinqua as a weapon, wouldn't dare be as reckless as Kenzo had been. But the young man in front of him hadn't even bothered to hide. Tell me, ghoul, you've invaded my territory, so I'll ask you a question, will you serve the crows, or will you die as food? I'm not here to be a damned pacifist like the crows. The ghoul yelled as he moved his kagun rapidly. Kenzo saw the shape of this man's kagun, and truth be told, it wasn't useless on the battlefield. However, it wasn't worth investing time and money in a ghoul that showed no intelligence. 
There were many species of ghouls, and the one in front of Kenzo was a discard class. In other words, it was an animal trying to feed irregularly. Even if they were trained, there would be very little progress in their strength and abilities. Knowing that there was nothing more to be done, behind Kenzo, a thick curtain of blood began to gush from his body, and soon the entire alley was flooded with that blood-like aura. His right arm, one of his main Kagun forms, was slowly covered by this mist that seemed to be alive. However, he knew his enemy was not formidable enough to use his Kagun. In an instant, Kenzo disappeared from his position, only to reappear like a phantom behind the ghoul who had openly displayed his Kagun. Ayahaha! In this desolate alley, only a man's scream echoed in the middle of the night. Chapter 4, Movements in District 20 Retrieve the package, it contains valuable material that can be used by another subject. In the middle of the alley, a ghoul lay lifeless with a large hole in its heart. Kenzo's right hand, on the other hand, had slight bloodstains, but these stains were gradually wiped away by the curtain of blood that surrounded him, eventually erasing all traces of blood from his body. After a few brief minutes, a dozen figures with crow masks appeared around Kenzo, who remained expressionless. His gaze turned toward the deformed crow mask at the center, and he asked, What's the situation, Viper? A high-class female ghoul of class S has entered District 20, and her way of devouring her victims is highly concerning for our stability. But as we've been investigating, her background is far from normal because she didn't enter District 20 alone. Viper walked inside following Kenzo as he sought a more secluded spot. Are there issues behind her? Kenzo inquired as he lit a cigarette. There are special cases in which both the Three-Eyed Crow organization and Antioch do not immediately get involved, and that's when other districts, along with external organizations, become entangled. In these cases, jobs are done much more cautiously, with planning and a strategy to avoid being directly associated with Antioku or themselves, known as the Farmer Crows. Although they don't typically distribute their product outside District 20, they do so at a much better price than usual and only deal directly with organizations that are worth maintaining good relations with. However, these organizations only turn to the Cuervos agricultors when they perform a ceremony and need very well-prepared product. Maintaining an adequate diet, members of the Three-Eyed Crow consume what they need and complement it with coffee. Those who eat until they are full are the S-Ranks, who are elite warriors, and the A-Ranks, who can aspire to become S-Ranks through cannibalism. Lower-ranking members are responsible for protecting clients, mobilizing product, cutting the product, and distributing it according to customer needs. Among them are non-combatants who work in crematories, where they replace bodies with ashes, unnoticed by anyone. Many others are undertakers who recover bodies of those who commit suicide and others who want to dispose of a corpse conveniently. Of course, the last option is if the body is fresh and there's a reasonable amount of money for that process. It can be cruel, but there is absolutely no human sentiment involved. Humans are food for ghouls, and for the Three-Eyed Crow organization, they are their main product for now. It's said for now because they are looking for a way to replace human meat with artificial, but that's a distant dream, and no one knows exactly when it will be achieved. The V organization may be involved. We are still investigating, but we won't take action against that female ghoul until we have more information. Her activity is aggressive, one victim per day, and unfortunately, she's drawing a lot of attention from the CCG. Viper was careful in this regard because Kenzo's main, very brutal and cautious enemies are the CCG. Kenzo didn't halt his movements, smiled coldly, and said, How many ghouls from Organization V entered? About a dozen. Security cameras have identified ten of them, and their movements revolve around the female ghoul who was nicknamed Glutton. You must have heard rumors about her. She's been here for a few days, but we wanted to have a complete report before the new recruitment started. Viper wanted to be very careful on this topic because Kenzo could be very sensitive about it, and he might even lose his composure. He knew that his boss was a cold man, usually adhering to the rules and not making significant moves because that would weaken them. But the fear and respect he had for his boss were due to the admiration a young ghoul gave him when he was recruited personally. Kenzo was that kind of leader, serious and composed, but there was much more hidden within him than he usually showed. Send me a complete report. I want to know who this crazy woman is causing disturbances in my district. Also, I want all lower-ranking crows to stay in the shadows. We'll restrict the work, alert the bodyguards, and food collectors. Kenzo said, becoming serious in this unexpected situation. I'll order that immediately, and also. Viper nodded while entering all the information into an electronic tablet, 
but just as he was about to say something, Kenzo intervened. I want only crows of rank A and S to stay on watch. We'll keep a low profile and won't interfere until the strike team is ready. This time, I will move personally. We must act carefully and not alert the beehive. Kenzo's words were cut off by the silent viper, who stopped moving. Viper wasn't very tall, and at first glance, he had a somewhat androgynous appearance. His physical build was quite small, so his features were rather subtle and youthful without the mask. But Kenzo, who saved him from a group of ghouls chasing him, gained his loyalty just by feeding him and his sister. Being an organization that required extreme control to make it work, he knew each of his S-class and higher-ranking subordinates, so it wasn't difficult to know that he had something more to say. Kenzo directed his calm gaze at Viper and asked in a subdued voice, What's going on? His blood scent seems stronger than usual. Has he done something recently that would make him stand out? That sweet blood scent is mixed with that of a ghoul, but it's subtle and can only be sensed with a keen sense of smell. Viper thought for a moment but finally mentioned what was bothering him. Kenzo sniffed his body and said, That is a problem. I knew it would happen, but not this soon. Although I don't need to feed on human food, I have to maintain my human meat diet to keep my combat abilities at their best. I suppose my ghoul cells are becoming stronger, and it's becoming difficult for me to conceal my scent. Over eleven years ago, he awakened as a ghoul, his irises turned red, and his sclera black. The desire to consume human flesh filled his every muscle, and his kaukaku type kagun fully manifested over his body. It was a terrifying morning, but fortunately, he knew how to remedy the situation, and he resolved it quickly. However, after eliminating a quite powerful ghoul with a nyukaku type kagun and devouring it, he experienced a kind of mutation within his blood, and his ghoul scent disappeared from his body, so he stopped bothering to bathe. During that time, he could control his strength, but it was complicated because of the mutation. So, he began to eat human flesh, and only then could he control his power, which had fused with his body. When Kenzo achieved that level of perfection with his kaguns completely in sync with his body, he decided not to resort to cannibalism, as his scent was a great advantage in his early years as a ghoul. This strategy worked very well in establishing his organization, the Crow of Three Eyes, and he began calling himself the Master Crow. However, he knew that at some point, his strength would be so great that he couldn't help but sweat the scent of a ghoul from his body. You know I have a sensitive nose, so nobody should find out, at least not for a few more months. Viper turned his head toward the distance and advised, but due to your constant interaction with those in the cafe, they might already know or find out much faster than expected. Kenzo nodded, walked back to the main street where three black cars were parked quietly at the side of the main avenue. His eyes turned towards the people walking with their partners, spouses, and children. A world destined for destruction, it will be much more challenging than he imagines to maintain balance, especially now. Putting that aside, the V organization, like all other districts, regards us poorly. This could be a surprise factor in our favor if they show an interest in this place after killing those intruders. Kenzo's eyes grew cold as he warned, although we want peace in this place, I'm sure in the districts they control, violence is permitted. Bringing the war to their doorstep. Viper understood what Kenzo meant, indeed, a brilliant idea worthy of an incredibly successful leader. Kenzo walked towards the central black car, and a man in a black suit opened the door. Take me close to the cafe, then return and rest. Things are getting more interesting. Yes, sir. The people without masks were ghouls hidden in their beautiful black suits, all of them working in a private security company providing their services to entrepreneurs. Having removed his mask, Viper revealed his beautiful blonde hair and pale blue eyes. With a calm look, he pulled out a file with various documents and said, Although it's not everything we know, knowing that I was going to meet you, I wanted to bring this and hand it to you. Taking the file with numerous documents, Kenzo furrowed his brow as he perused the detailed report prepared for her after disrupting the order in District 20. I can see it was almost everything. Kenzo saw the comprehensive report and felt proud of his organization. They were getting closer to perfection with each step. Now, looking at the gluttonous ghoul, whose real name is Riz, she's a slim girl with long, straight, bright purple hair, purple eyes and an hourglass figure. Like other ghouls, she blends into human society, often wearing stylish, form-fitting outfits suitable for a young woman, demonstrating a preference for dresses. In all the photos Kenzo found, he knew that this woman was a very dangerous viper he had to be extremely cautious of. Amos Step, and his identity as the master crow of his mysterious organization would be exposed, 
at least within the ghoul world. Master Crow, you mustn't involve yourself in this minor issue, the crows will handle it for you, and you won't risk being discovered. Tell me, do you want us to kill her? Viper couldn't hide his worried expression, despite his efforts. Kenzo smiled a bit and said, something doesn't add up. I want to know why she is of interest to the V organization and determine if her value is important for finding a weapon to use if necessary. Reading the files, Kenzo discovered that unlike some ghouls, Riz is independent and acts on her own without following any rules. She typically uses her attractiveness to lure victims, who always fall into her traps. She doesn't seem to have any ambitions, constantly seeking to kill her boredom in any way. If she is a ghoul, she should visit some coffee places, and the most famous one in this district is Antiaku, known only to ghouls. I will eventually get to know her. So Kenzo said, select a strike team, we'll move when the V organization takes action against Riz. However, before we act, we need to know what they want from her, and then we'll proceed. Your orders are my will, Master Crow. Viper couldn't do anything when Kenzo made a decision, so he had to accept it, although it was somewhat risky. Nevertheless, he didn't fear for Kenzo's safety but for those who would be their enemies. While Kenzo hated the V organization for killing his mother, his ambition and coldness went beyond his emotions. His control over his plans could be so extreme that nothing escaped him, so he couldn't let his emotions cloud his judgment. He would eventually eliminate the V organization, and an incredibly attractive opportunity had just presented itself. Chapter 5, I Can't Ignore the Scent of Blood The number of ghouls in District 20 is much smaller than in other districts, which is why special recruitment efforts are made in other areas. Many who wish to lead a peaceful life arrive at the doors of the Crow's Third Eye Organization. Why is this organization called that? It's quite simple, the Crow is a creature of the night and can see everything at all times. If it exists, the Crow's Third Eye Organization can discern the truth in no time. Additionally, Rumors had it that the crows from this organization neutralize ghouls before they even make their first move in District 20. Their level of tranquility and the energy they spend to protect their existence from humans are a mockery to all ghouls from other districts. Why shouldn't they hunt their victims and devour anyone who looks appetizing? Many couldn't grasp the lifestyle sought in District 20. What is sought here is the integration of ghouls into human life. Obviously, there are other ghouls with much higher objectives than just living quietly. Some seek revenge while others simply want to be part of the mysterious Crow's Third Eye organization. How many ghouls are in their ranks? Perhaps hundreds, even thousands. But those who have joined them know that there are not only fighting ghouls but also those who lead a normal life. Only those who are part of the Crow's Third Eye organization know the feeling of living without fear. They can all work to earn money, buy human flesh as if it were bread, and earn a proper salary for any kind of needs they have. Kenzo focused on creating his own functional system with ghouls. They would be his workers, and in return, they would receive food, money, and protection from him. What does he get in return? Their gratitude and loyalty. Everyone thinks District 20 is weak, but no organization has wanted to take this place. Even before Kenzo's organization existed, there was some level of tranquility in this area. However, with their presence, there were very few cases of disappearances and even fewer of mutilations. Investigators had been sent, but none had returned. So the attention and resources that would have been spent on a weak region were instead focused on the stronger ones to increase their influence and power. To survive, peace, tranquility, or drinking coffee every day are not needed. Kenzo knew that survival required an impenetrable security system, contingency plans, protocols, and a well-preserved food supply. Making money is easy, the challenge is keeping hundreds of mouths fed without problems. But knowing the demand, Kenzo would soon expand his empire secretly into unexpected areas where it wouldn't affect the hunting of other ghouls. In the car, Kenzo thought about many things, but every topic ultimately led to his father. His elderly father was broken on the inside, but even though he could sense that his activities were irregular, he kept his distance. Yet, Kenzo knew that at least with him, there would be no problem in sharing some things from his past. He had matured enough to know how to let go of past wounds, but he did it only as the last respect he had left for his father. Hey, Viper, what would you be willing to do to protect your sister? Kenzo's sudden question was simple but made Viper look up. I don't know. To be honest, I'm not capable of simulating such a great dose of emotions, and I haven't reached that limit to question it. Viper's response was straightforward, leaving Kenzo as he was before. Kenzo gazed at Viper for a few seconds and said, Forget it, 
you're too dull. After a few minutes, a black car stopped not far from Antioco Cafe, and Kenzo got out after a brief moment of arrival. Things had become a bit interesting, and one could say they were in his favor. There were many questions without a satisfying answer, and it was hard not to notice. Back at the old cafe, it was already very late at night, and the cafe had closed. However, in the living room, manager Yashimura was still cleaning the cups at the counter and had not gone to sleep. The biggest headache was seeing Tuka, who was lying on a customer's table, holding a coffee cup in her hand, staring out the window with a face full of boredom. I'm back. At that moment, Kenzo pushed the door and entered. Hey, Kenzo, why did you come back so late again? Tuka, who was lying on a customer's table, got up at that moment and walked in front of Kenzo with an obvious frown on her face. Uh, why haven't you gone to sleep yet? Kenzo held the back of his neck while calmly looking at Tuka, who seemed more concerned than she needed to be. Don't worry about that, you. Tuka huffed as she tried to grab his shirt. Why? Kenzo lightly dodged her. Hey Kenzo, when did you learn to smoke? Tuka finally huffed when she noticed the smell of cigarettes, but when she realized what she had said, her voice became weaker. The manager at the counter also raised his head and slightly furrowed his brow. At this moment, Kenzo was 21 years old, and he had been a high school student until recently. Haha, didn't expect to find another kind of smell on my body, did you? Kenzo smiled a bit as he walked to the counter and pointed, ghouls and humans can smoke, what's wrong with that? It's better to smell like cigarettes than women, isn't that much better? I. Tuka was stunned when she heard those words and didn't know what to say for a moment. Go to sleep, Tuka. I need to have a few words with manager Yashimura. Kenzo looked at Tuka deeply this time, and his voice was much colder, almost ordering her to leave. All right, good night. Tuka slowly climbed the stairs but stopped halfway to check if Kenzo wasn't crossing a line with her father. Kyuzen Yashimura, still expressionless, continued cleaning the cups, and in a moment, he served a coffee to his silent son. Then he said, I haven't asked you for anything since you moved to this place. I thought I had no right after leaving you in another home. Kenzo calmly sipped his coffee and said, When you told me you were different, everyone here is different, you know what I thought. Kyuzen fell silent, his gaze turned to Kenzo, and he couldn't decipher where Kenzo was going with this. Still, he said, You've been very quiet since I brought you here. If that's changed in recent years, it doesn't mean you show much of what you feel in your actions. It was very amusing, your ghoul scent was very strong, and in fact, I knew that after coming to this place. I suppose after observing you in these last years, I found out that you don't have any significant purpose in keeping me here, but I have plenty of reasons for staying in this place. After saying that, Kenzo looked at his coffee, and the pupils of both his eyes began to slowly turn red, and the sclera black. The black lines around his eyes became deeply marked, and the hidden scent of his body was revealed very subtly. But it was enough for Kyuzen to open his eyes and look into his son's. How was that possible? His son was human, he had confirmed it, he was entirely human when he was born. Kyuzen Yashimura's puzzled expression became less evident, and after a few minutes, he finally gathered the courage to ask, how did this happen? I guess the behavior of the body is something we haven't extensively researched, but my sister is half ghoul and half human. On the other hand, I was born completely as a normal human. However, at the age of 10, after a ghoul attack, I fully awakened my hidden power. After 10 years, I am becoming more ghoul than human every day. I preferred to tell you before you figured it out, but I guess you've been speculating about something for a long time. At this point, Kenzo lied subtly, changing many parts of the story, as he didn't suffer a ghoul attack at the age of 10. On the contrary, he underwent a mutation in his body that turned him into a half-human, half-ghoul. However, as time passed, his ghoul side was becoming more dominant, and slowly, the scent of his body, even noticed by Viper, would become more evident. Staying at Antioca was only to gather any history about his family from his father's words, but he never told him anything, which annoyed him every time he thought about it. Over the years, he grew somewhat fond of this place, but his mission was much bigger than this simple life, and he knew it perfectly. It's not necessary to delve into my experience, but I joined the Cuervo de Tres Ojos organization. They took care of me and trained me when I thought I was just one of those monsters you hear about in the news. Kenzo drank his coffee and said, You know what I want from you, father. Tell me personally, why did you let them trample over you? 
Kuzan Yashimura had accepted that his son hated him, after all, he had told him part of their story, omitting significant details. Taking a deep breath, he looked at his son and said, I needed to keep them safe. Your mother knew it, and that's why I decided to do what was necessary to save them. Although Kenzo didn't expect anything, he was still extremely angry. He looked at his father one last time and said, You are very strong, father. I'm sure you're strong enough to eliminate the entire V organization, but despite that, you lost brutally. Anyway, don't tell the others about what I told you. I will leave here before they realize I'm a ghoul, so there won't be any need to waste energy on that. Leaving Kyuz and Yashimura in silence, Kenzo went up the stairs to his room. As he watched Kenzo's back as he climbed the stairs, Yashimura sighed and couldn't say anything. In fact, he could sense what was happening with his son's body, but he really didn't expect that after being human for ten years, he would become a ghoul shortly after. The stimulation he had suffered in that ghoul attack must have awakened something inside him, granting him access to his dormant ghoul side. Right now, when Kenzo entered his room, Yashimura stopped what he was doing and sighed, knowing that his son was trying to seek out his past. Every night he would go out to eliminate unaffiliated ghouls, somehow following the orders of the Cuervo de Tres Ojos organization. I was careless. Yashimura murmured as he turned off the lights in the café. He already knew that his son had a connection to the Cuervo de Tres Ojos organization, which is why he decided to trust them. He was not disappointed since, for ten years, they had done nothing more than live peacefully, just like Antiaku. All he wanted now was to heal Kenzo, and for him to do the same for his sister. Both of them had to live free of the vengeance that would eventually consume them. At least, they could. Chapter 6, How Had I Not Realized Before? I should have stayed to listen. Tuka rolled on her bed while thinking about what she might have discovered if she had eavesdropped on their conversation. After a few seconds of eavesdropping, she had decided to leave out of respect for boss Yashimura and Kenzo, both of whom needed to clear their differences but had never done so before. Perhaps tonight would be the night, so she finally decided to leave after thinking about it for a long time. I hope both of them managed to get closer. Tuka finally fell asleep, imagining what Kenzo was talking about with his father. Kenzo slept soundly throughout the night. In his silent, dark room. After sleeping for a long time, Kenzo suddenly opened his eyes, sat up suddenly from the bed, lightly covered his chest with his broad palms, gasped continuously, and sat on the bed without understanding what was happening, looking at the dark room, unable to recover for a long time due to the sudden shock. After a while, he turned his head, looked at the slightly dark space outside the window, touched his face unconsciously, recalled the real scene in the dream a moment ago, and, for some reason, suddenly had a feeling of déjà vu. But in a daze, the things in the dream turned blurred again, unreal, and when Kenzo wanted to remember them carefully, he couldn't remember anything at all. Sighing helplessly, Kenzo stopped thinking about it for the time being, lifted the quilt covering his body, and got out of bed, walking directly to the bathroom, reaching out to take a shower, but before that, he held the water with both hands and rinsed his face directly. The water touched his cheeks, instantly making him much more sober. After wiping away the remaining water spots on his face, he raised his head and looked at the mirror in front of him. In the mirror, there was a 22-year-old man with messy hair and a lack of good emotions. All this time, the lives he had taken, no matter how little it affected him, had caused subtle and very noticeable changes. Kenzo lowered his gaze, looked at the water, and the reflection of his face displayed a very different feeling. Kenzo took off his sweat-soaked black shirt, revealing his large and muscular physique. He was a tall and very muscular man, very different from the average men in this country, which set him apart from the rest. When he finished examining his body and started to feel a little better, he walked to the shower to cleanse his body and finished in about five minutes. He took a towel from the bathroom and began to dry himself. There were several scars on his body, many of which had been caused by accidents or fights before he became a full ghoul, memories and marks that reminded him of where he came from and what he wanted. After freshening up, he left the bathroom, left his dirty clothes on a chair, and then took a set of clothes similar to what he had on from the closet and began changing. He walked over to the table where some of his important belongings were and started putting them in his pockets. Once he was ready, he walked downstairs to the cafe. Upon seeing him, Tuka hesitated to say anything but continued attending to her own matters with a cold expression. At this moment, Kenzo's eyes turned towards a guest who had just arrived. This female guest exuded mature femininity, and as soon as she entered the cafe, 
she garnered the attention of many people. Rizkami Shiro. Kenzo recognized the woman at a glance. Immediately, in his cold and calculating manner, Kenzo noticed that she occasionally glanced at a couple of young men at another table. Kenzo recognized one of the young men at that moment but had simply not noticed him earlier due to his subtle behavior. This young man is, naturally, the boy he had called a brat the day before, and from the loudness of his friend, he should be called Kanaki. It's just that Kenzo's attention quickly returned to Rizkami Shiro. Indeed, this woman was exactly like the report he had received about her, and she truly exuded a very enticing aura. The way she hunted made her act in that manner, a straightforward way to attract men, but it's certainly much more striking if she does it in a cafe where many of the customers are ghouls. While Kenzo was lost in his thoughts, a voice beside him slowly reminded him, Kenzo, don't be fooled by this woman's appearance, you'll end up more than hurt if you are not careful. Manager Yashimura had appeared by his side and cautioned him while preparing coffee. Oh. Kenzo, who had a bored expression, felt a little annoyed, recalling that he had provided information the day before but hadn't received anything in return from his father figure. This guest. Tuka immediately wanted to go and greet Rizkami Shiro at this moment but was interrupted by Kenzo, who took the menu from her hands. Wait, let me go. Kenzo, with the menu in hand, walked over to the table where the woman had sat down and placed it in front of her. At. Rizkami Shiro looked at Kenzo, slightly surprised, and after a few seconds, she gave him a delicate smile. Thank you. A soft and watery voice came from Riz's mouth. Her seduction skills were very refined, but it was a pity that Kenzo was colder than ice on the inside, and such situations didn't affect him. It's not very common for beauties like you to visit this old cafe. What would you like to drink? Let me invite you this time. Kenzo sat openly in front of Riz and gave her a somewhat disinterested look with his narrow eyes, immediately giving him an air of someone uninterested in others, which intrigued Riz. Oh. Like a seasoned actress, Riz Kami Shiro was surprised for a moment, making her wonder something. Is the casually dressed person in front of her an employee of this place? Why did he just sit down in front of her with such little care? Tuka was also stunned. She could tell, even if she was foolish, that Kenzo struck up a conversation because he saw that the other party was beautiful. This was Kenzo's most notable advantage, his tired look and disinterested appearance often caused people around him to misjudge him, when in reality, he was a quite calculated and careful man in each of his actions. After a while, Tuka turned her head in anger and left, not before giving Kenzo a very obvious look of disdain. Is that your girlfriend? She seems upset with your attitude in talking to me so openly. Rizkami Shiro said this with a smile, giving the man in front of her a scrutinizing gaze. My girlfriend. Kenzo smiled strangely for a moment and asked, don't we make a great couple? Too bad I've been rejected by her many times, not to mention, maybe she does it because we're co-workers. Now that I think about it, my taste in women has always been special. Kenzo said again as he crossed his right leg over his left. Every passing minute, Rizkami Shiro was becoming more intrigued by him. At that moment, the TV hanging on the wall of the old cafe played a news report about the gluttonous ghoul that had recently appeared in District 20. What happened recently in District 20 is really terrifying, isn't it? Kenzo observed how Rizkami Shiro's expression changed, whether intentionally or not. Kenzo could feel those subtle mood changes perfectly, which made him smile even more in silence and think, damn witch, how dare you come to my district and openly do as you please. If you weren't so valuable, I'd have crushed you a thousand times against the ground. However, Rizkami Shiro seemed calm, as if the recent massacre had nothing to do with her. She could clearly sense that the man in front of her was very different, not as simple as an ordinary person on the surface but still human, judging by his rich scent. Here it is. At that moment, manager Yashimura appeared at Kenzo's side. At. Kenzo gave the old man, his father, a questioning look with a raised eyebrow. This is the coffee you ordered, savor it slowly. Manager Yashimura took the coffee from the tray and placed it in front of Rizkami Shiro. Thank you. Rizkami Shiro made a gracious gesture. Have you already placed your order? I can't recall. Yashimura gave a calm look to his son, who was acting quite clueless and said, she's a regular customer, always orders the same thing, so today I took the liberty of serving her fastest, just as I do with my most loyal customers. That's what you call customer service. Kenzo stood up and left at that moment. 
he knew that his father obviously knew that Rizkami Shiro was the glutton who recently appeared on television. It wasn't necessary to know how he knew, as the man who ran the operations base for District 20 was right here in this cafe. Anything that happened here, as long as Kyuz and Yashimura wanted to know, was impossible to hide by any means. Hey! Took a look at Kenzo approaching, snorted with arrogance, and cast an obvious look of disgust towards Rizkami Shiro. Kenzo's disinterested gaze soon found Tuka's, and an affectionate smile appeared on his face as he asked, Don't tell me, is my dear Tuka jealous? What did you say? Kenzo leaned in, extended his hands, and held Tuka's waist while no one was looking. He spoke with a smile, You will be the woman I marry, but dear, don't be jealous. You shouldn't stop your amazing friend from talking to other women. Only you are in my eyes, I don't usually approach anyone I don't know. Siko, do you know who that woman is? Tuka said with disdain as she tried to remove Kenzo's large hands from her waist. Well, who is she? Kenzo asked mischievously as he leaned closer to the girl in front of him. Tuka frowned, looked around to make sure no one was listening, and finally whispered, she's the glutton who recently appeared on television. Oh, I'm so scared. But I'm sure my dear Tuka will keep me safe from the clutches of that witch. You better eat me before she does. Kenzo finally pulled away, and his ironic smile was directed at the aggressive Tuka standing before him. One of his most entertaining moments was teasing this woman, who seemed to harbor a deep hatred beneath her kindness. That combination was extremely dangerous and at the same time attractive in Kenzo's eyes. Chapter 7, The Master Crow Appears In the CCG Division Two ghoul investigators held a report in their hands. Another ghoul we were investigating disappeared overnight. Judging by the traces of blood that weren't intentionally hidden, it seems the victim died instantly in one place. There were signs of a battle, but no other type of blood samples. It's strange that the ghoul of the books died so unexpectedly. He is extremely cautious, and although his victims are countless, each of his movements is well studied. Perhaps the crows took care of it, they are the ones operating in District 20. But it's been years since they made a big move. Could something have happened? District 20 is very peculiar. It's referred to as a safe zone, but many A and S ranked ghouls disappear within days of entering the area. Lately, the safe area is not as peaceful as before, so things must be very significant for them not to be subdued. Is District 20 really that important? There's a well organized group of ghouls in District 20, so organized that they never seem to venture out at night, keeping their faces hidden from the light. That's why any ghoul incident in that district always draws a lot of attention. If we arrive before them, we might learn more. Anyway, our job is to investigate whatever is happening in District 20. Of course, our real mission is this. Well, I'm just curious, why now, after so many years, are they letting a ghoul start hunting in the safe area? If we think about it that way, maybe the ghoul moving in District 20 is stronger than the organization you mentioned. No, it's not like that. They call themselves the Crows, and among them is a Class S, SS, or maybe even SSS ghoul. Their leader goes by the name Master Crow, and they've given us many threats not to target the places where the Crows sleep. Things like that, which is why, even though it's safe here, this place can be more dangerous than any other district. District 20 Night descended quietly over District 20, covering its streets with a dark and mysterious cloak. Street lights began to flicker, casting yellow flashes on the pavement. The city's bustle gradually faded, leaving room for the whisper of the wind between the buildings. As was customary, Kenzo was in remote places, investigating and, at the same time, ensuring that everything was in order. Currently, his organization operates like a criminal entity. When there is chaos, they usually must hide and not reveal themselves so openly due to the care required to protect everything they have built. Open surveillance activities cease, ghouls within the organization refrain from going out at night, and their activities, in general, go into a state of hibernation. During this time, some of them began to participate in more social activities and moved away from the area of the troublesome ghoul who had been causing chaos in District 20. They were all fine because they had been doing this for years, and it was always a foolproof method that kept them protected. No one had ever recognized a ghoul within the Three-Eyed Crow organization, and there had never been a need for combat. The difference today was that the Crow Warriors, who were usually in charge of nighttime businesses like clubs, restaurants, crematories, taxi drivers, night guards, mechanics, and customer service, were more alert than usual. A select group was chosen to accompany the Master Crow on an expedition mission. 
All of them had wanted to work alongside the Master Crow at some point in the last five years, but they had only seen him at special celebration ceremonies. The last time they had worked together was six years ago to eliminate a rival criminal network they now cooperated with. Several days had passed since Rizkami Shiro disappeared from their radar, and even though his crows were handling it this time, he wanted to do it personally. Once the organization V made a move, he would also act and eliminate them all. This time seemed to be just another hunting day for Riz, who had taken the boy named Kanaki after leaving the cafe. Kenzo knew that Riz must be very important to the organization V due to the continuous tracking from many districts behind. As long as the organization V showed up, that was all that mattered to Kenzo right now. He knew very little about the past, but all he needed to know was who had caused his mother's death, and he had to finish what his father didn't have the courage to do. If he ever met someone from the organization V, no matter who it was, Kenzo would kill them mercilessly. ZZ. Viper, where is she? Kenzo walked back and forth in the dark alley at this moment. If it weren't for Tuka's nagging and his father's warnings, he could have been here in advance and not have been late for the party. Once that woman was ambushed, Kenzo could act alongside his members who were shadowing him. ZZ. Master Crow, she's starting, and there are unidentified ghouls nearby. Ah. At that moment, a scream sounded not far away. Hmm. I found it. Kenzo's eyes showed a sadistic emotion, and he quickly moved with a dozen more figures to where the source of the sound had come from. At night in District 20, there were generally no pedestrians in such remote alleys. Most of the surrounding areas could be inhabited by ghouls lurking in the darkness, feeding on humans. Even though there were no feeding zones here due to the presence of the Three-Eyed Crow organization, people could still run into unexpected encounters. Just as Kenzo had suspected, Ken Kanaki was in shock from the large bite on his shoulder. Rizkami Shiro had a smile on her face, completely in agreement with the mature woman she used to be at the old cafe. But after tasting Kanaki, her face was filled with ecstasy. Ah! Kanaki clutched his head, spat out blood, and his eyes were filled with fear. Rizkami Shiro licked her lips, with a trace of blood at the corner of her mouth, as she had just tasted her delicious victim. At last, we meet, Miss Glutton. I apologize for introducing myself so late, but it was a necessary evil for somewhat selfish reasons. Kenzo's raspy voice sounded from a distant area, yet it seemed closer than usual. Who? Rizkami Shiro's eyes turned towards the source of the sound knowing it was other ghouls. Since her arrival, no one had crossed her path, and she assumed that no one had the courage to confront her, but now it seemed that was not the case. Help me. Kanaki saw someone approaching, as if he were grasping his last hope of survival. However, when he saw the figure emerging from the darkness, his hope shattered. It's you, the one who calls himself the Crow Master. Kami Shiro Riz recognized the figure that emerged from the darkness due to his extremely dark appearance and that characteristic mask. Kenzo, like a mysterious and enigmatic figure, advanced in the darkness, his presence shrouded in a bloody aura that seemed to emanate from his being. Every inch of his figure was hidden behind a dark and macabre disguise that made him look like something out of a nightmare. He wore a large crow mask over his face, with sharp beaks and enigmatic eyes hidden behind it, revealing only glimpses of malevolence. The mask added an air of mystery and terror to his appearance. A long, tattered black trench coat covered his entire body, from shoulders to feet. The fabric gracefully fluttered in the wind, as if it had a life of its own, creating a sense of ominous grandeur. However, the most striking aspect was what lay behind his back. A large, blood-red wing emerged from his back, with black details that made it resemble a mix between a crow's wing and a fallen angel's. It was majestic and terrifying at the same time slowly spreading in the air like a sinister omen. This single left wing was as beautiful as it was sinister, his distinctive kagu nyokaku, which was easily recognized as his enormous crow wing. His hands were covered by black leather gloves, adding the finishing touch to his dark attire. Overall, this enigmatic man embodied darkness and mystery, and his presence left an indelible impression on those who had the unfortunate opportunity to cross his path. To everyone else, he was the crow master, the leader of the three-eyed crow organization, and the father of the crows that moved in the darkness. His voice was as indifferent as the wind, so he mentioned while holding a crow-tipped cane, well, it seems you recognize me, so I could assume you're not a foolish bitch who ventures into others' territory on a whim, right, Riz? But you're lucky, I'll only watch from the shadows. Really? It seems you've seen this kind of scene before. Rizkami Shiro laughed at Kenzo's calm demeanor. Yes, 
these sorts of things happen often around here, in my territory. I usually assess the situation and pass judgment after they finish their meal. Kenzo said provocatively. Ha! Huh. Well, in that case, I can say I like that. Wait, do you enjoy watching ghouls eat? Rizkami Shiro moistened her lips, ignoring Kenzo's provocation. At that moment, Kanaki was desperate because he realized that the figure that appeared was not here to save him at all. By the way, there's one thing I need to remind you of, crows can fly, but ghouls never pay attention to what's overhead. A small reminder as a symbol of our friendship. Kenzo tilted his head slightly, and his cane pointed towards the sky. Chapter 8, Blackwing Um, just above me. Rizkami Shiro was momentarily confused by Kenzo's actions but still looked up. Boom. A loud crash resounded as a massive pile of steel bars unexpectedly fell from the tall building. How? Rizkami Shiro widened her eyes, but it was already too late to move. Boom. With a thunderous noise, a huge pile of steel bars fell precisely on top of Riz. Even Kaneki was buried in the dust, and his life and death were uncertain in Kenzo's eyes. Damn, who? Beneath the rubble of steel bars, Riz opened her bloodshot eyes wide, and her consciousness began to blur. At this moment, Kenzo raised his head, looked up, and a strange smile crossed the corner of his mouth. Have a group monitor what they do with Riz from the shadows. Do not act until I order, but if you see that she is being taken out of District 20, retrieve her her body, alive or dead, I don't care. Yes, Master Crow. At that moment, Kenzo waved his kagun and, with just the rush of air, ascended to one of the upper floors of the under construction building, where several dark figures were peering down. If we are not mistaken, that is the Master Crow, about whom little is known, but he ensures that District 20 remains calm. What should we do? Let's go. We are at a far enough distance that he won't catch us. One figure was about to turn away when suddenly, right in front of them, a figure wrapped in a massive crimson wing appeared just behind them. Ah, damn. Haha. <laughs> He's much faster than expected, and his kagun is simply spectacular. An wing as large as that must be extremely rare for a ghoul. One of the shadows didn't seem to worry about Kenzo's appearance, as if it were no big deal in their eyes. However, what happened next surprised them. Don't let anyone get away, my crows. Kenzo's voice spread through the area, and over a dozen men with crow masks appeared around the figures hiding in the darkness. Now we're in serious trouble. The figure that seemed to be the leader held his hat with a somber expression covering his face. Damn. The black figures on the roof were stunned by the appearance of ghouls so fast that even they couldn't react at that speed. Are they sure they are just a small organization distributing food? The plan has changed. You four, stop them. One of the shadows said, and the figure quickly tried to escape, but at that moment, two ghouls with crow masks showed their kagun and repelled the figure trying to flee. Damn it. Kill him. The four figures said, and their kagun also emerged from their bodies, but all of this was in vain. The V organization should know not to make their dirty moves in districts where they have no power. We, the three-eyed crows, respect the territories of other organizations, and all we ask is that none of you enter our home without prior consultation. Kenzo's words echoed in the surroundings, and before they realized it, he had vanished as if he were a ghost, and a surge of a bloody aura spread throughout. Who did you ask for permission to intrude in my home? At that moment, Kenzo's figure reappeared as a shadow beside one of the ghouls who were in formation, and with a single sweep of his wing, he cleaved them in half. Boom. One of the ghouls had reacted quickly and launched several Kagun projectiles at high speed, but Kenzo shielded his body with his enormous wing. Boom. 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 Having protected himself from any harm, with a swift movement of his wing, the dust scattered around, and the remaining ghoul's eyes closed for a few seconds. However, during that time, Kenzo condensed several drops of blood in the air and with a Kagun movement, they were propelled like projectiles toward the disoriented ghouls. Like bullets, the legs, arms, chests, and faces were pierced by Kenzo's blood, and several ghouls fell to the ground without being able to react. The strength of this guy, it's incredible. The ghouls who had suffered fewer injuries shuddered at the power of the Crow Master. The rest remained on the ground, unable to get up due to the severe injuries caused by just a drop of Kenzo's blood. I wonder why a bunch of losers like you were sent to pursue Riz, even going so far as to pay money to other districts to catch her. Kenzo stood in front of the remaining ghouls, looking at them with a sense of disdain in his words. Cough cough. 
At that moment, the ghoul who had attempted to escape had been defeated by Kenzo's crows without much difficulty. You shouldn't have gotten involved, now all of you will have to be killed by the V organization. The elderly man's voice sounded from outside, along with the roar of a ghoul who aggressively unleashed his kagun. Hmm. What's he supposed to be doing? Kenzo frowned. At that moment, Kenzo's right hand began to be covered with a faint, bubbling, bloody kakuhau, but it didn't form anything else. This represented his other kaukaku type kagun, ultimately a kagun mutated by cannibalism. Kill him, kill him. I'm going to eat him. One of the men roared with a fierce expression. It's curious that you want to do that in your situation. That's why I argue that the best way to resolve a conflict is through dialogue. But now that's impossible, come together, and don't waste my time any longer. Kenzo's roar was aggressive, so he stopped wasting time trying to obtain any information from these idiotic ghouls. Boom. This time, Kenzo didn't waste any more words, he would kill them all without asking anything else. At that moment, when his crimson eyes fixed on those ghouls who were by no means weak, the kaguns of those ghouls began to twist and grow larger. Just as Kenzo had thought, these ghouls had a good regenerative factor, but it was useless to keep them alive. Through their dialogue, he discovered that they were indeed part of the V organization. If that's the case, Kenzo only needs one of them alive, as for the rest, they must die. Boom. Kenzo's figure vanished again from where he stood, leaving the ghouls in formation astounded. But right after, several meters away from them, several drops of blood pierced through their bodies. Kenzo had appeared right behind them and formed more blood drops. After that, propelled by his incredible speed, he headed for the most severely wounded ghoul and kicked his neck. Crack. The sound of the neck breaking was clear, and with that kick, Kenzo spun his body, immediately causing his kagun to split his enemy's body in two. This time, the blood drops were large and powerful. All the crows standing around could tell that Kenzo was having fun. He hadn't trained his combat skills for a long time, so it was only natural that he would play with these people, especially since he despised them to the core. During his subsequent attacks, the kaguns of the two remaining ghouls who were trying to shield themselves from the impacts were effortlessly shredded. This time, Kenzo's speed increased, and he almost appeared instantaneously, like a blink of an eye. He grabbed one of the ghouls by the collar and violently hurled him to the ground. Boom. The ground caved in, and the ghoul who had been trying to stay awake closed his eyes as Kenzo's kagun cut off half of his head. Ah. The last remaining ghoul, who had attacked Kenzo earlier, let out a horrific scream, seeing how all his companions had been so easily massacred by the crow master, whom everyone had called a coward. At that moment, the ghoul who had wanted to escape at least wanted to kill Kenzo, so he moved, and his long kagun aimed for his enemy's head. It's useless. Kenzo moved his wing-shaped kagun to cover his entire upper body. The ground beneath his feet cracked, demonstrating the tremendous pressure that the ghoul was exerting on his body. Waving his wing, Kenzo pushed away the ghoul's kagun and said, All except you are going to die. Let me go. The last ghoul in the group that had attacked Kenzo frantically pleaded, but it was in vain when he saw the wing approaching his body. All he could do was use his hands to protect himself, but it was all futile since his body was instantly severed. This, how is it possible? The leader of the group sent by the V organization collapsed onto the ground upon seeing his entire group dead. Shock was written all over his face, Kenzo's strength had already surpassed his imagination. You'll be useful to me, you'd better start talking. Kenzo said while holding the old man by the throat and choking him forcefully. Chapter 9, How Are You Going To Do That Exactly? Ah! Damn it! I'm going to kill you! Kill you! At the top of the building, the old ghoul found himself in a desperate situation, teetering on the brink of death at the hands of Kenzo. How are you going to do that exactly? Kenzo observed the old ghoul in a monotone manner due to his mask. From what he knows, these ghouls were likely S-rank, sent directly on this mission. The situation is really interesting, now all he needs to do is keep this old man in the air and give him a good beating right here to find out if he would obtain useful information. Boom. 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 Every blow Kenzo delivered to this person generated a rather loud noise, the blows were very powerful, causing the ghoul's bones to crumble. Exerting more and more force, Kenzo's eyes gleamed slightly through the openings in his crow mask. The blood that fell onto his attire and the ground slowly filled with parts of his kagun, and the bloody aura gradually became thicker. For a while, pieces of clothing, skin, and blood brutally covered the floor. Damn it! 
Damn it. O.M. Throwing the old man to the ground, Kenzo concealed his kagun and said, Give me information about Organization V. What the hell are they doing in District 20, and why do they want Riz? The old ghoul lay on the ground, spitting blood, his body exhausted to the limit, and now he couldn't move freely. Tell me special information about Organization V, why the hell are you here, and I can send you to another country without your bosses finding out. Kenzo walked over and stepped on the face of the elderly ghoul. His black boots slowly crushed the ghoul's head with slight pressure, as if he were stepping on something foul rather than a human head. You don't even know what the consequences of betraying the organization will be. One of the corpses that, according to Kenzo, was dead, raised his head a few seconds before dying. If it weren't for the fear of involving his important people in his betrayal, who would be willing to work for Organization V? Consequences? Well, well. Then, do you know what the consequences of going against the crows will be? Kenzo's right hand formed a kagun in a few seconds and struck the ground with force. Boom. The already weakened ground couldn't withstand Kenzo's blow, and it collapsed to the lower floor, dust and gravel flying everywhere, causing the sole survivor to cough up blood. You damn dogs, nobody knows who they are, but you dare to go against Organization V. I hope you understand the value of the people around you because they're the first ones who will suffer. Will they come once I eliminate you? That's exactly what I want, but I'd like to know what the consequences of going against a disastrous organization like VR. When Kenzo heard this, he held his forehead and almost laughed at the dying ghoul's antics. His father was an SSS rank ghoul, and a mere organization like V couldn't provoke him so easily, and Kenzo's strength could be considered at that level. He had never reached his limit before, so he didn't know exactly. This is a pity. Kenzo knew that this man wouldn't talk so easily, so all that's left for him is to finish this. Since you're not willing to talk, you and all your companions will serve as sources of Kagun for other young ghouls within my organization. Isn't that fantastic? After Kenzo said that, he applied more force with his feet, and the old ghoul's head disappeared. Crack. A bloody scene could be seen all around, but that blood was soon consumed by Kenzo's aura, and after a few seconds, he said, let's take all the corpses they'll be essential for other ghouls to obtain their kaguns through cannibalism. Yes, Master Crow. The five corpses were soon carried by the crows, and they all descended from the building directly into the vans that would transport them to the secret base. Eating some finely chopped human flesh, Kenzo consumed a cube with little expression, and after arriving where Riz was, he ordered his subordinates to remove the metal tubes. Viper approached and said in a calm tone, Lord Crow, we've dealt with all the enemies in the area. We found another ghoul nearby and eliminated him directly to maintain appearances. Kenzo listened to this in silence and nodded in understanding. You made the right choice, let's leave this place as soon as possible. While listening to the mission report, several white vans were soon parked near the construction site building, and Riz, who had lost mobility, was buried under a pile of steel bars. Help me. Riz's voice was very weak, but when she saw Kenzo, she finally gathered the strength to ask for help. Miss Riz, you're not dead yet, and that's a miracle, quite astonishing. Kenzo walked toward where Riz was and asked her, you've only brought me trouble after trouble. Tell me honestly, how will you be of any use to me? Master Crow, an ambulance and several police cars are approaching. Viper informed Kenzo, who was speaking comfortably with Riz. Riz Kashimro's eyes opened, and she looked at Kenzo through the space. You are very useful but also a rebellious woman. How will I know you'll be useful if you're extremely aggressive and uncontrollable? I hate to say it, but you're useful to me. However, I'll also be honest with you and tell you that even if you're useful, if you become a problem, I'll eliminate you. So tell me, should I kill you or save you, and in return, gain your favor? Yes. Those people are coming for me. Riz showed an ironic smile at this moment. If you help me, I'll join your organization, I'll be useful to you. Kenzo smiled beneath his mask and, after moving all the bars, removed his leather glove, brought his mouth closer to Riz's and said, Bite, live, and serve me as long as I see fit. None of the crows were perturbed by this, it was the joining ritual only for ghouls above S rank, so many of them had gone through this ritual and were the most loyal of the three-eyed crow organization. The moment Kenzo extended his hand, Riz's teeth tore a part of Kenzo's hand, and when she felt the blood flowing down her throat, it was the most magical sensation she had ever felt in her life. However, she didn't have time to enjoy the taste as sleep slowly overcame her, and she closed her eyes. 
Very well, put her with the others and keep her under observation. Leave the body of the ghoul they eliminated right here, and let's go back. Watching Rizka Shimro's body being loaded into one of the vans, Kenzo looked at the body of the ghoul that had been thrown to the side of Kanaki and, shaking his head, got into one of the vans. Are you sure about working with that lunatic? Viper wasn't convinced, but there was also nothing wrong with trying. Kenzo removed his mask and said, Well, if it doesn't work, you're allowed to kill her. Keep her well fed, but don't trust her too much. I understand, Master Crow. Chapter 10, Someday We Will Have to Fight for Real In an unknown place. We are not monsters, we cry, we laugh, and we die just like humans. We are a living organism that only seeks tranquility, but due to our circumstances, we get scared like beasts caged within a rather terrifying metropolis, where we are judged as beasts that must be eliminated. Kenzo stood up in front of over 200 ghouls who would join the organization Crow of Three Eyes, his gaze filled with serenity, and all signs of exhaustion had been discarded from his face at this moment. He was currently in one of the main bases, an old abandoned theater in the heart of District 20, where ghouls were trained and selections were made that would defend their lives from now on. The rules, principles and shared vision were the only things they would adopt from now on. Addressing hundreds of ghouls and many others who were already veterans of the Crow of Three Eyes organization, Kenzo opened his hands and said, My dear brothers and sisters ghouls, today we are all gathered here for different reasons. Some of you seek protection, security and strength in a world that has relegated us to the shadows. We are the crows, the guardians of the night and we are destined to lead a change that will transcend our lives and pave a new path for the generations to come. We, the ghouls, are not monsters. We are not abominations destined to hide indefinitely in the darkness. We are beings with the same thirst for life, love and belonging as any other human. It is time for us to reject the darkness in which we have lived for so long and seek a world where we can coexist in harmony with humans. But to achieve this vision of a peaceful future, we must be willing to sacrifice a lot. We must be willing to bleed for a better world. Make no mistake, the path we have chosen will not be easy. We will face challenges, hatred, and prejudice. But let us remember that we are strong, we are brave, and we are a united family. Each of you has a role to play in this struggle. We must be role models for future generations. We must show that ghouls can be compassionate, understanding, and peaceful beings. We must fight those who seek to destroy us but we must also be a beacon of hope for humanity. Today, with the integration of new recruits into the Crow of Three Eyes organization, we are taking the first step towards that world in harmony. Together, we will build a safe haven for all ghouls seeking a place to belong. Together, we will work to change humans' perception of us. Remember, we are not alone in this fight. We have the support of our brothers and sisters present here and of all the ghouls who share our dream. Let us move forward with determination and courage and one day, our efforts will be rewarded with a world where we do not have to hide, a world where we can live in peace and harmony alongside humans. But also remember, we will not be the puppets of humans, and we will never stoop to the level of dogs. We will establish our own worth and fight a long war to sustain it, whether alive or dead, some of us here will enjoy that united future. Let's fight together, my dear crows, for the united world we deserve. Ah! Let's go to battle. We will defend our existence. In a private room, there were nine seats where ghouls with crow masks were watching this exciting speech, but none of them had an expression of admiration, pity or hatred. I wonder how he does it. He always manages to excite the newcomers. Even now, my cold blood vibrates with excitement when I hear my master brimming with so much energy, despite being the most indifferent among us. He's preparing us for a war. We've been in hiding for over seven years, and we can say that we've fully integrated into District 20, but still, he doesn't think it's enough. Maybe, the time has finally come, we will take the other districts under the power of the crows. A two-meter tall man looked at the young man who said that and shook his head, Denji, if we start a war recklessly, the CCG will eat us alive, we must match their technological level first. Denji is a disheveled blonde-haired teenager with deep brown eyes and dark circles, making him look tired, but he was an SS class ghoul and was in the top three, just below Viper, who was also an SS class. After being advised in that way, he stopped paying attention to the two-meter-tall man nicknamed Ares. Always with that technology stuff, you'll die without seeing a flying car, you old fool. Denji was annoyed, although he was strong, everyone cared for and advised him as if he were a child. Aren't you supposed to be in school, demon child? 
Denji jumped from his seat and shouted, Old drunk, it's already night. Barbosa, stop tasting that wine that's still in the initial stages of mass production. Shouted a man named Kazuma, who was the weakest of the nine pillars of the organization, but he was here because his great ingenuity was making significant advances so that ghouls could enjoy something more than just meat, coffee, and water. Damn kids, how the hell are we the pillars of this organization and in complete shambles? Asked Barbosa, the old drunk. Kazuma is a 25-year-old young man who appears to be a 17- or 18-year-old teenager. He has messy black hair, black eyes, and constantly dilated pupils. To be honest, he doesn't care about living in harmony with humans or something like that, what matters to him is researching and creating new foods that ghouls can consume. But because he needed money, joining this place was the best option he could take. So, what do we do with the sadistic woman that the Master Crow brought in? She's an S or SS class ghoul, containing her would be a threat. Do you really have orders to kill her if she becomes a problem? Barbosa became more serious and asked Viper, who was the strictest leader and, in turn, Kenzo's right-hand man. Viper, who had been silent, nodded and said, we will kill her if she's a problem. She's now in a containment room and will be incinerated at high temperatures if she poses a threat to our regime. She was about to die under some metal pipes, do you think she's a problem for the high crows? The coldness in Viper's tone was justified, they were all elites, each a captain of powerful ghouls with A and S class ranks. What would doubting a crazy woman who had been brought into the base complexes amount to? If they doubt, that doubt will be transmitted to their subordinates. It was against the rules to be inferior to their ranks, if they weren't capable enough to earn the respect of the hundreds of ghouls they commanded, could they achieve the dreams that many ghouls hope to achieve someday? Things are much more worrisome than we thought. The CCG is a threat we must always be prepared for. Even if we're ghouls, we need to excel in combat and have plenty of weapons in addition to our Kagun. That would be essential to defeat them in battle. Kazuma stopped appearing disinterested and nodded in agreement with Viper's theory. Unifying all the districts is the first major step, agreeing to negotiate with humans is the second. If that doesn't happen, we'll seek acceptance in our own way. Kazuma understood the significance of this, so he just smiled and said, it's still very terrifying. Kenzo's plans are so destructive that it's impressive how he seems disinterested in everything around him. He is the master crow. It was already past four in the morning, and everyone in the cafeteria had fallen asleep. Kenzo believed that when suddenly a slender hand firmly grabbed his shirt. It was obviously Tuka's hand, who seemed to have been sleeping at one of the cafeteria tables and woke up because of the noise he made when he entered. You haven't gone to sleep yet. Kenzo's gaze locked onto Tuka's, for a moment, he believed that everyone should be asleep, but it turned out she was still awake. Your scent of blood can't be hidden. What have you been doing outside so late? Tuka's gaze was filled with sadness. She didn't want Kenzo to be consumed by a desire for revenge. She knew a lot about his history because Kenzo had told her himself, so once she knew the truth, she couldn't leave him alone. Do you like my scent? Kenzo asked with a deep look in Tuka's eyes. Tuka was at a loss for words. She had never expected to receive such a serious question in the late hours, and because she had been asleep, she couldn't respond with full sobriety. Remembering the delicious scent of Kenzo, she closed her eyes and brought her nose to the man's chest. You smell delicious. Kenzo, being taller than Tuka, snorted coldly and lifted her in his arms, holding her by the legs. What do you think you're doing? Tuka's heart began to beat strongly. She regained some of her senses and wanted to resist but after feeling that they were going up the stairs, she fell silent to avoid alerting anyone. Wait. Tuka was lifted to the level of Kenzo's gaze, and she immediately lowered her eyes. His actions were very bold and unexpected. Look into my eyes. Are you drunk? Tuka looked at him, puzzled. His face, hidden in the darkness, was flushed, and she couldn't fully see Kenzo's expression at this moment. Do you want me to leave? You can decide now. At that moment, Tuka stopped hesitating, her gaze met Kenzo's, and her lips gently touched the man's neck. There's no turning back. Kenzo's voice snapped Tuka out of her reverie. She had kissed his neck with a delicate electric sensation. Kenzo's rough and warm hands caressed Tuka's tense body. She instinctively pushed him away, only to end up held even more firmly in his embrace when he wrapped an arm around her waist. As Kenzo's hands touched her skin, she felt her body beginning to exude an unfamiliar heat that made her shiver for a reason she couldn't explain. You're acting very strange today. Oh, Kenzo, 
not so close. Chapter 11, Red Moon Kenzo began to kiss Tuka's beautiful neck as if he hadn't heard such a soft request. He gently let Tuka's weakened body fall and began to kiss her abdomen. In just a few minutes, several pieces of clothing had disappeared from their bodies as if they had magically vanished. When Kenzo's tongue touched her skin, Tuka's eyes opened in surprise. Warm lips traced her soft skin, initially giving her a ticklish sensation. At that moment, a shiver ran down her body as she felt this new sensation. But in no time, those lips reached her chest, and a delicate moan escaped her lips. Ah! Seeing Kenzo buried in her chest as if he were a newborn baby, Tuka's mind went blank. Kenzo, we're going too fast. Just relax. With his large hand, Kenzo caressed Tuka's back, who was paralyzed by the new sensations and emotions she was experiencing. His moist breath gave her goosebumps. Rubbing his chin against her smooth skin, Kenzo slid his hand under the garment covering Tuka's waist. She jumped in restlessness, her hands and lips trembling. She had never imagined that a man's hand would venture into this region of her body. What are you doing, idiot? You've been driving me crazy for a while, Tuka. Tuka's legs on the bed exerted force, but not enough to push Kenzo away. She didn't want this sensation to go away right now. Tuka remembered that Kenzo had never been romantic with her, even though she was in love with him, and now. Now, here he was, touching her most intimate parts as naturally as if they had been dating for years. She couldn't believe it and, at the same time, was secretly delighted. They'll hear us. No. She grabbed Kenzo's broad shoulders as if to push him away. But now it was his turn to shudder and tremble. Tuka's hands unconsciously slid over his large shoulders and strong muscles, this masculine sensation was driving her crazy. Tuka's lips moved slowly as her delicate moans filled the room. But immediately after, a rough kiss sealed her erotic sounds. Kenzo's saliva had traces of her blood, which made Tuka's eyes turn crimson, and her tongue, which hadn't tasted blood in a long time, began to seek more of that incredible taste in Kenzo's mouth. Flooded with passion and the taste of Kenzo's blood, Tuka soon found herself with no clothing left on her body. Feeling so exposed, she wanted to try to push Kenzo away again, but a deeper kiss silenced her words that she didn't want to say. Damn it! Tuka let out curses and moans. She was just gasping for air like a fish out of water. A loathsome man she was deeply in love with was invading parts of her body and giving them electric sensations she didn't know existed. That hand that had reached her most special area soon began to give her a delicious sensation. She was captivated and unconsciously asked for more. In the midst of her embarrassing actions, she kicked her legs against Kenzo's body, but they were soon pressed down by the weight of the muscular man on top of her. You damn idiot, when did you become so crazy? Just today. Kenzo muttered these words as he surrendered to the captivating sounds he couldn't stop hearing. Tuka had heard from her friend about pleasuring herself, but the last time she tried, she felt strange because she always thought of Kenzo. In these moments, under the touch of this idiot, she shuddered and writhed like a fish in the air, overwhelmed by these unthinkable sensations. Ah! Oh! It was useless to stop now, it would be a disservice to both of them not to continue. They couldn't stop right now when their rational thoughts had ceased to function and their bodies took over. Tuka took the initiative this time, holding Kenzo's disheveled hair while looking into his eyes. She had a captivating aura around her. When she became more aggressive, she thought to herself, what's happening to me? Tuka, is this really okay? After what felt like a lifetime, Kenzo asked Tuka openly, not with physical gestures. And you ask me this now? If you don't have me today, I might devour you right now. Tuka didn't know where those bold words came from, but she said exactly what she felt. Tuka sank into the bed, trying to catch her breath. Her body had been so tense that, with little strength left and a burning desire running through her, she didn't want to stop now. In the end, Kenzo undressed completely and wrapped his arms around Tuka's waist, lifting her ever so slightly. Their warm bodies touched. It was only then that Tuka realized that their bodies were drenched in sweat. She could feel Kenzo's muscles and her hand slid over the man's back and chest, the one who had taken the initiative to please her. I always told you, you're the only one in my eyes. Kenzo's voice had become hoarse, making it even difficult to understand his words. His lips brushed against Tuka's ear, sending shivers down her spine. Clinging to his massive shoulders, her legs instinctively parted. Kenzo, taken aback, did what he wanted to do most. Ah! Tuka didn't feel any pain, instead, 
a sense of ecstasy completely invaded her body, giving her a profound aggressiveness. She was deeply in love with this feeling. She lightly bit Kenzo's chest, and the blood that had intoxicated her didn't make her realize anything. Both pressed their bodies together, sharing warmth and merging into this new sensation. At this point, Kenzo's eyes had also turned red as they felt the connection of the sensations satisfying their bodies. More. Tuka's weak whisper made Kenzo burn with desire. His hands gripped her hips, and their movements became increasingly intense. The brutality of a ghoul and the ecstasy of sex soon turned them into demons in bed. Look at me, Tuka. Amidst this pleasure-filled sensation, Tuka's eyes met Kenzo's gaze, and she was somewhat surprised to see those red eyes in Kenzo's weary face. How did you? Tuka's words were sealed with a new kiss from Kenzo, and this time she didn't hold back, taking a bite that let her taste the delicious blood of this man. Now you're my woman, I'll protect you deeply and won't let anyone harm you. These words momentarily concluded an intense struggle that had lasted for hours. Kenzo reached out, brushing the hair from Tuka's forehead. This time, she kissed him, over and over again. They kissed, bit, and fought beneath the sheets. Both succumbed to their desires and let it happen. I love you, you idiot. Tuka whispered as she gazed at Kenzo with infinite tenderness, a beautiful expression she had never shown him before, making Kenzo fall deeply and irreversibly in love with her. Chapter 12, What Happened? Kenzo had several anger issues, and he typically let that feeling grow and subside by hunting ghouls that entered District 20 to cause trouble. But something strange happened when he consumed human flesh, he felt a peculiar numbing sensation, as if he were a bit drunk, along with heightened senses. It was difficult to explain in words, but some strange things did happen to him. When Kenzo opened his eyes, he felt slightly pressed by a completely naked female body on top of him. Kenzo's calm eyes met Tuka's, and although he was surprised, he remained calm. It really happened. How did we end up in this situation? Kenzo was in a state of ecstasy, and even though he remembered everything perfectly, the high level of satisfaction made him wonder if it was a dream since he wouldn't have acted that way under normal circumstances. It was certainly pleasant, and he couldn't say he was a romantic man, but if it happened, it was for a reason, and he would take responsibility for everything that had occurred. It's not that he didn't feel something nice for Tuka, what he thought was that now he had a significant weakness. If it happened that night, it was because both he and she allowed it. Both were strong enough to refuse, but if they let it happen, it was because they both felt something for each other. While Kenzo thought about all of this, he lowered his gaze and met Tuka's calm, observing eyes. Kenzo, though calm, felt a bit of discomfort because he didn't know what to say, so he just spoke up, good morning. It was an amazing night. Arg. As Kenzo was about to finish his words, took a bit into his chest to the point where blood started to seep onto the sheets. She wanted to say many things, but the first thing she did was to moderate Kenzo roughly because she felt a mix of anger and confusion. Are you an animal? Kenzo shouted as he raised his hands to grip Tuka's shoulders, but after a few moments, she got out of bed, covering herself with a sheet. Are you angry? Was it that bad? Well, that's definitely not an appropriate question considering what happened last night. Kenzo's gaze turned slightly smug as he thought about it, and then a plastic cup hit his head. Boom. What's wrong? Why didn't you tell me you're a ghoul? Tuka wasn't angry about what happened last night but because she found out in the midst of it that he was a ghoul when initially she thought he was human. When Kenzo understood what was bothering Tuka, he smiled slightly and got up. I plan to tell you, well, I certainly never planned to tell you, but now you know, and it's much better. Are you playing innocent? Tuka shouted as she threw another plastic cup at him, and because of that, Kenzo got up from the bed a little dazed. Hey, hey, isn't it better to know it late than never? You're the only one in the cafe who knows, are you angry? Kenzo asked as he walked towards Tuka, who had fallen silent. He thought she had calmed down, but then he heard something surprising. Hey, why aren't you wearing any clothes? Obviously, because we slept together, don't you remember? Boom. Tuka clenched her fist and punched Kenzo in the stomach because of his lack of intelligence. She felt very embarrassed seeing the bite marks with dried blood on his body and all the blood she had wiped from her mouth just moments ago. Remembering her aggressive actions made her blush a bit, but eventually, she calmed down. Kenzo wasn't nervous or embarrassed at all, so she wouldn't act foolishly. But now that she thought about it, what were they now? Seeing that Tuka appeared confused, 
Kenzo smiled mysteriously and said, So, my dear Tuka, how should I address you? Couples have nicknames they call each other, should I call you my little grump? Hmm, no, how about my sweetheart? We should keep this a secret, it would be too troublesome if someone else found out because we live together, although, of course, I don't mind. Tuka furrowed her brows because she knew Kenzo was teasing her. He often behaved this way, even though in most cases, he was cold, calm, and confident. He also enjoyed clever banter with people capable of it, but he had never been like this with anyone else. You should clean this place, I have to help with work. Since you don't work, you can at least clean up this mess. Tuka was about to take a shower when suddenly large arms held her by the waist. She turned around and then wild lips gave her a deep kiss. What are you doing? Kenzo didn't want to leave things incomplete, he didn't plan to say that something like this didn't matter to him, so he decided to take a step forward. I'll take care of it, my grumpy girlfriend. When we have free time, I'll tell you everything about me that you don't know. What do you say? Okay. Tuka blushed a bit but was deeply happy. So, what nickname will you give me as a couple? Kenzo asked as he folded the blood-stained sheets. Tuka's bites had been deep, causing more blood than usual. I'll call you by your name, as I always have. Stop pretending and clean up without anyone noticing because it would be embarrassing if someone finds out about us. Tuka said these last words in a barely audible tone, but Kenzo heard them perfectly. After seeing her enter the shower, his expression returned to normal. Their relationship had to remain a secret for the time being, not because he cared about what others thought. What concerned him a little was the fact that their future enemies might target his only vulnerable loved one. She wasn't weak, but she certainly couldn't face the attacks of an entire organization. Now that they were expanding into District 19, which didn't seem to have a representative who posed a threat, they would find a way through Route V14 for now to send their products and move new ghouls to the training area. All of them had to go through training before joining the Three-Eyed Crow organization. As long as they gain control of District 19, it will have a significant influence on the two neighboring districts, and, of course, they will deal with the Jukiyama family from District 21, who are high-ranking entrepreneurs. Kenzo noticed them when they requested their exquisite materials, participated in their auctions, and sponsored their more sophisticated research, like cloned human meat. Today was supposed to be the date. Kenzo wrapped the blood-stained sheets and then, after thinking for a bit, handed Tuka a credit card to buy whatever she wanted and needed without any problem. His issue was also to talk to Riz. She was somewhat secondary in his plans, and if she isn't of any use, he would end up killing her. He had no use for a woman who didn't want to follow the rules, especially someone who killed without restraint every day. Ghouls are different from humans in one aspect, most ghouls only eat once or twice a month. This is enough for non-combatants, but it's incredibly impossible to maintain this diet for warriors seeking to become stronger and always be in peak condition. After leaving Tuka's room, he walked to his own room and took a shower. His thoughts constantly flowed with cause and effect, and he knew that every step he took from now on had to be extremely careful to avoid making a mistake. Perhaps it would be easy to take over District 19 and subsequently 21 so that they could consume District 17. The leader of the Jukiyama family would understand this perfectly, and he certainly wouldn't lose out on his deal to take control of their territory. Unlike District 20, District 21 didn't have such strict control causing hungry ghouls to roam freely, which is why only District 20 is recognized as a weak area. He put on a black t-shirt, loose light-colored pants with a black belt, and black sneakers. He was ready for whatever situations he might encounter. When he went downstairs, he approached the counter and took a coffee in a disposable cup before leaving without saying a word. Tuka hadn't come down yet, and it was much earlier than usual. Koma Enji, with a perplexed expression, asked, Is that Kenzo? How did he get up so early? Maybe someone woke him up. Irimi Kaya glanced at Tuka, who was slowly coming down the stairs as if she was afraid Kenzo would suddenly be here and call her sweetheart. Kenzo has already left. Did you fight with him again? Tuka blushed a bit and mumbled, a little. Goodness, at least you beat that idiot. Boss, I should be given permission to beat that lazy son of yours who only brings unnecessary worries. Koma Enji shook his head as he prepared a cappuccino. There's no need, I can handle his education. Tuka smiled faintly. Since Kenzo had spoken with Riz, she had certainly felt jealous, but now she had left her scent on him, so no one would dare go against Kenzo. Chapter 13, 
keeping the secret. After leaving, Kenzo decided to walk down the street without much haste. After a decade of operating in the underworld of clandestine business, Kenzo had managed to expand impressively into various nocturnal and business industries. His network of businesses had transformed into a complex web that spanned from bars and nightclubs to restaurants, security companies, cleaning services, regular stores, cafes, and many other activities. Each of these businesses served both legitimate and dark purposes in Kenzo's grand scheme of operations. Bars and nightclubs were the perfect facade for laundering large sums of money. There, cash transactions mingled with the legitimate income from customers, making the money trail nearly impossible to follow. Restaurants also served as ideal places for this purpose, and business dinners with local politicians and entrepreneurs further disguised the source of funds. Security and cleaning companies provided an additional layer of protection and cover-up. Security kept nosy outsiders and external threats at bay, while the cleaning staff helped eliminate any incriminating evidence and maintain the places looking immaculate. Regular stores and cafes were used as vehicles to launder money more gradually and less suspiciously. Legitimate earnings were mixed with illegal ones, and tax declarations were meticulously filed to avoid raising suspicions. But the boldest move of all was the focus on constructing apartment buildings. Kenzo used these real estate investments to place his trusted people, thus ensuring stable employment and absolute control over his network. Additionally, these buildings also served as additional sources of income through property rentals to third parties, further facilitating the concealment of illegal money. However, Kenzo was aware of the risks involved in his operations and always stayed one step ahead of the law. He had a team of expert lawyers and accountants who worked diligently to ensure that all transactions were difficult to trace. Ghost companies, offshore bank accounts, and international transactions were just some of the techniques used to hide his illicit fortune. Over the years, Kenzo had perfected his ability to operate in the shadows, building a clandestine empire that defied laws and morals. His success lay in his cunning ability to balance legality and illegality, weaving a complex web of businesses that kept him anonymous while accumulating wealth and power. But he also knew that in this dark world, danger always loomed, and a single mistake could bring it all crashing down. Without his trusted men, the famous nine pillars he hoped would become ten in the future, he couldn't have achieved all this because he did very little personally. In addition to helping anyone in need, these individuals who were actually ghouls had education and work experience. If he placed them in the right positions, they would simply be ordinary people. His ambition was certainly enormous, but his focus was always on reintegrating ghouls into the normal world and maintaining that secure control as long as there was peace. All of his crows were calm, living in the shadows and rarely showing their beaks, but each of them would rise in the darkness if their world was threatened. This is why, in addition to the warrior ghouls, those who simply tried to live a normal life would fight to keep that dream alive, which until now seemed stable. They all respected the crow master, and in one way or another, they had all obtained what they desired. Food abounded in abundance, with good management, and there was always bread to be had. Of course, not normal humans like the people surrounding Kenzo at this moment, but unforgivable criminals or powerful individuals who believed themselves above others. Rapists, murderers, swindlers, and pedophiles were just some of their victims, and all of them ended up as food. The best part was that no one missed them. Five years ago, when food was scarce, his organization attacked a maximum security prison. Of course, maximum security was for humans, not ghouls. That act was the last one performed by the Three-Eyed Crow organization before disappearing into the shadows. But on the internet, everyone believed it was more than perfect that bad people became food for ghouls. This made Kenzo open his eyes and think that somehow they could all live together just as they were secretly doing. Mom, that man is super muscular. When I grow up, I'll be just as strong to protect you. A child with a bruise on his face held his mother's hand, which hid signs of abuse, catching Kenzo's attention. Walking toward the child, he asked, don't you think it might be too late? The child looked seriously at Kenzo and said, I can't do anything. My father hits my mom when he's drunk, and when I try to stop him, he did this to me. The boy's mother panicked, immediately picked up her little son, bowed her head, and rushed away. But Kenzo's voice stopped her, please wait, hold on a minute. Kenzo, who managed to stop the lady, smiled and whispered, I shouldn't say this, but I can help you with your problem. I don't concern myself with your private life but if you ever want to make the cancer in your family disappear, just call this number, and I promise you'll never hear from that man again. I don't need it. Feel free to take the business card anyway. Remember, 
were available 24 hours a day and more effective than the police. Kenzo stopped before continuing on his way to a large library. It seemed there would be a book conference today, and he wanted to see a special person. Just as he was about to move away, a child's voice came from behind, and the same boy said, Thank you. I'm sure my mother will call you. In the end, everyone calls. Kenzo continued his journey, reminiscing about his sister. He hadn't seen her in a long time, and now that they were both 22, they probably had few memories of each other. The first time they met was at 16, then at 20, and finally two years later, Kenzo would be the one to take the initiative to visit her. The conference would be about her and some other writers, but the most famous by far was the writer Takatsu Kisen, and the chosen venue was a very informal yet cozy one. Kenzo unknowingly arrived at the location after about 20 minutes, and many renowned writers were in attendance. Among the most well-known was Takatsu Kisen. Kenzo found her immediately when he entered the exhibition hall. Like Takatsu Kisen, she was an attractive woman of medium height at 22 years old. She typically wore curious and sleepy dresses in a modest manner. Her long green hair usually looked messy and disheveled, tied up above her head with a messy bun. However, despite her usually disheveled appearance, she was a great beauty with many admirers. To Kenzo, she bore a striking resemblance to his mother, Yukina. Her personality was extremely complex, with intelligence and emotion as a human and cruelty and rage as a ghoul. Kenzo had known her as Ido Yashimura, but he had never before been able to observe her every action, and, honestly, he hadn't cared much about her before now. What he did know was that she was strong despite her small and beautiful appearance. Because she had chosen to have a separate identity from her last name, she went by the pen name Takatsu Kisen as a novelist and often attended various events like an ordinary person. Since she was half-human, just like Kenzo, they could pass through RC scanning gates that usually detected non-humans. This stroke of luck allowed them to live relatively normal lives. These gates were quite impressive because they were used to detect and identify ghouls, merely by trying to enter a secured area. Fortunately, these devices were present in buildings owned by the Ghoul Countermeasures Commission and were used to prevent ghouls from passing beyond the main entrance. These devices were considered too expensive for use in most public and government buildings, which limited their usage to the CCG. Nevertheless, they were a vital tool to prevent ghouls from infiltrating important government positions. At that moment, Ito was engaging with her readers with a smile on her face, but then her eyes noticed Kenzo, who was sitting not far away. At Ito frowned. She hadn't expected that boy to come to such an occasion. Kenzo didn't approach her but gave a slight wave of greeting to his sister, Ito. I'm sorry, let's take a ten-minute break. Ito kindly informed her readers and then walked slowly toward Kenzo. It seems your works have attracted many readers. Kenzo looked at Ito and teased with a smile. Of course, but why did you come here? Ito responded generously. Both she and he knew each other's true ghoul identities but she didn't know that he controlled the secretive three-eyed crow organization. Can't I come to see my sister who disappears every three years? Kenzo clasped his chest as if wounded by his sister's words. Then it's a real honor for me that the famous and solitary Kenzo has come to visit. Ito said in a tone that wasn't really submissive. Uh. My dear sister, you're not still mad, are you? Kenzo asked with a sly smile. Mad? My dear brother, why would you think that? Ito laughed sweetly. Well. It seems my dear sister is still mad. Kenzo said with more certainty after hearing Ito's tone. Fine, if there's nothing else, I won't accompany you to the door. You can do as you please. Ito said, turning around with the intention of leaving. Seeing Ito walk away, Kenzo didn't stop her either. Not long ago, his younger sister had invited him to join the Aojirai tree immediately after discovering his true identity as a ghoul. However, Kenzo had rejected it without hesitation, which had always troubled Ito. Ito had a very open personality. She was always lively and cheerful when dealing with other people, but she wore a different expression when confronting Kenzo in his ghoul form. Kenzo sighed, turned around, exited the exhibition hall, and lit a cigarette outside. He had rejected her for a good reason. He wanted to meet with her as the leader of the Three-Eyed Crow and not as her brother. Of course, his motive was to uncover her intentions with that organization and whether it would be an obstacle he needed to worry about. As Kenzo smoked, it began to rain, and he furrowed his brows in disapproval. After finally going out to meet his grumpy sister, she seemed angry because she thought he couldn't understand her and, of course, because she lived with the father she despised. 
This made Kenzo feel very annoyed. Just as Kenzo was filled with emotions, he looked at a large tree not far away. At that moment, Ito also left the exhibition venue early, perhaps because of the appearance of her brother, which left her somewhat distracted. Along with the rainy weather, she also felt inexplicably irritable, and she was now walking in the rain under a large tree. Seeing this, Kenzo felt that an opportunity had arrived. As the older brother, he felt the need to do something for his sister, who seemed to have little control over her future. Kenzo took an umbrella from a man in a suit, then walked slowly toward his sister and asked, How about I take you back home? The rain probably won't stop for a while. Thank you, but my friend will be here soon. Ito responded casually without looking at Kenzo. Hearing this, Kenzo's expression cooled. His sister had always been this way with him the times they'd met, which had always bothered him. With a sigh of annoyance, he placed the umbrella on the ground and said, You don't even understand me. Why are you getting angry over a decision I made based on my thoughts about the future? You have no right to be mad without first getting to know me well, but you should stop that unjustified hatred toward others. Leaving these words behind, Kenzo left his younger sister alone once again. You're not the only one who's angry at the world. Chapter 14, The Complexity of Siblings Ito Yashimura stood still as the light rain gradually covered her head, intensifying with each passing moment. Damn it, this bastard of a brother. Did he think his help wasn't welcome? Reacting now, Ito, fists clenched and teeth gritted, scolded him. However, Kenzo, impatient with his sister's mood, had distanced himself. In this moment, on Kenzo's side, he was returning calmly, unfazed by the rain soaking his body. After moving in with his father, Kenzo learned about the existence of his sister and that she had been a ghoul since birth. His father had always spoken highly of her but left her in the care of a trusted man to ensure she learned about the world of ghouls. When he turned 20 and his influence within District 20 was absolute, his sister, Ito, appeared before him with a considerably large man and brought him to their home. They spoke calmly until that man attacked him with a force strong enough to kill a human. Kenzo instinctively defended himself brutally against the man when their blows were exchanged using their superhuman strength. Once Kenzo had overpowered the man, Ito ordered him to stop. She was thrilled that her long-lost brother had similar abilities to her. Ito had always found it absurd that Kenzo wasn't a ghoul when they shared the same genetics, so she tried to verify it herself. To her amazement, she was correct. Upon discovering this, she naturally invited him to join her organization, called the Aojirai Tree, to which Kenzo staunchly refused. As the leader of the Three-Eyed Crow organization, Kenzo was well aware of Aojirai Tree's stance and knew they were a group with terrorist tendencies and supremacist ideologies. Kenzo had his own objectives but, before refusing, he wanted to obtain vital information from his sister. He directly asked, Are you the leader of the organization? When she said no, she mentioned the One-Eyed King and identified him as the leader of the Aojirai Tree. He didn't need to know more, so after his refusal, he hadn't seen his sister for two years, until now. He had a lot of information on his primary rival in case he decided to extend his influence to other districts, which was the Aojirai Tree. So, the one he needed to eliminate was the One-Eyed King, who until two years ago was just a symbol to Kenzo. Aojirai Tree was united under the ideology of ghoul supremacy over humanity, promoted by the One-Eyed King. Aojirai aimed to have ghouls dominate as a species, making plans to overthrow humanity and ascend to dominion. Small mistake, little sister. Your war has just begun, and you've already lost. Kenzo knew, as the leader of the Three-Eyed Crow organization, that humans cannot be defeated. Ghouls, creatures of the night known for their strength and insatiable appetite for human flesh, might appear terrifying and powerful at first glance. However, there are fundamental reasons why they could never win against humans, no matter how strong they are. Firstly, humans have a remarkable ability to adapt to changing situations and overcome challenges. Human history is marked by resilience and the ability to confront threats. When humans feel threatened, they tend to unite, share knowledge and resources, and develop strategies to survive. This adaptability is one of the main advantages humans have over any threat, including ghouls. Of course, Kenzo knows that no ghoul has ever reached this conclusion because they don't understand humans and tend to underestimate them most of the time. As he has observed, most ghouls are like hungry beasts, and they consider humans as nothing more than food. For him and the values of the Three-Eyed Crow organization, although ghouls can be portrayed as powerful creatures, 
their lack of adaptability, intelligence, organizational ability and their focus on violence and cannibalism put them at a disadvantage compared to humans' ability to evolve and overcome threats. Humans' ability to unite, innovate and utilize resources and technology is a strength that would allow them to prevail in a prolonged conflict against ghouls, regardless of the latter's physical strength. Standing at a red traffic light, Kenzo glanced towards a specific location. At this moment, he had a clear sense that someone appeared to be following him. However, what's strange is that the people following him seem to be ordinary, not ghouls sent by his sister. Kenzo remains aware of his surroundings without investing all of his efforts into this task. But what Kenzo never expected was that the person following him was, in fact, an investigator from the CCG, Commission of Counter Ghoul. If he was correct, there should be no reason he was being pursued because he had been careful with every move. There was a possibility that this involved his meeting with his sister, but his identity as a writer couldn't be linked to that of a ghoul. In that case, someone possibly sent this investigator to gather information, and that's the problem he doesn't know who that might be. I made a small mistake by getting involved with my sister, that's the only gap in my path. Kenzo's activities are not very frequent precisely because he doesn't want to be caught. But he supposed District 20 had always attracted the CCG's attention, along with the mysterious and unpredictable strength of the Three-Eyed Crow organization. Still, there weren't many people who knew Kenzo's true identity. CCG can be such a nuisance. As he walked calmly, Kenzo lit a cigarette and casually glanced at the person following him before hailing a taxi. On the other end of the street. We were careless. For a moment, I thought he had discovered us. A middle-aged man named Shota Watanabe clutched his chest with growing fear inside. They've discovered you, old fool. However, a voice behind him spoke. How? Shota Watanabe in a black suit turned his head back. Are you a ghoul investigator, class 2, Suzuya Jozo? The older Shota recognized the person in front of him with a single glance. Old man, next time you go on a mission, remember to change your clothes. Your outfit easily attracts people's attention. Suzuya Jozo offered advice to the man who had been following Kenzo, although he wasn't an old man, his age should be in his forties. I understand. As soon as Shota heard those words, he accepted the advice without much fuss. All right, I'm off. Suzuya Jozo said, turning around and walking away in small leaps. Darn it, a kid gave me advice on my job. Seeing the boy of no more than twenty leave, Shoya smiled ironically. And at that moment, Suzuya Jozo entered a public restroom and took a wallet from his pocket. Uh. Besides a wad of cash, there seems to be only a photo. Who is the person in the photo? Suzuya Jozo kept scrutinizing the wallet in his hands. The wallet belonged to Kenzo. During the writer's exhibition, Suzuya Jozo intentionally bumped into Kenzo with the goal of stealing his wallet. Kenzo got so upset that he snatched the umbrella from that brat, and in that moment, his wallet was also taken from him. In recent days, his attention had been elsewhere, and at that particular moment, he was solely focused on looking at his sister, so he didn't bother worrying about a stupid kid he had bumped into. Moshi Moshi. It's Suzuya Jozo. I found information about the target reported anonymously. MMM, there's an address for a house but nothing else connecting it. Yes, there are coupons for a laundry service, restaurants, and a photo of an unknown woman. Oh, you found it so quickly? Then. Come to the CCG branch in District 20, we need to further investigate the report. The voice on the other end of the phone seemed anxious. However, Suzuya Jozo had no idea of the trouble he had just caused Kenzo after stealing his wallet. Of course, no one had truly experienced the wrath of the Crow Master. Because Kenzo was getting into a taxi at that moment, he had no idea that his wallet had been taken from him just a few minutes ago. Hello, love. No, I'm on my way back. By the way, are you afraid I'll be with another woman after proposing to you? In a relationship, you have to have trust and not pressure too much. Yes, I love you too. Kenzo maintained a smile while responding to a series of insults over the phone. His dear Tuka was very affectionate, after all. Regarding Tuka, who became his girlfriend after that night, Kenzo wasn't foolish. He knew she had shown affection toward him from the moment they got to know each other better. It's just that Kenzo hadn't been very interested in a romantic relationship in recent years. But after some time, he thought it wasn't so bad to have such a charming girlfriend as Tuka, although he never thought he'd take the first step, and then a kiss led to a bite. Is your fiancé calling you? After hanging up the phone, 
the taxi driver asked with a smile. Haha, she has quite a temper. But I understand her better than she does herself. I guess I'm very captivated by her. Kenzo felt a warm feeling when he heard these words. The taxi stopped at a traffic light. At that moment, two women were fighting in the street, and they both seemed startled. Kenzo also noticed that the two women had probably had a significant encounter with the man who claimed to be single. The driver suddenly asked, Young man, are you in a hurry? No, what's going on? Kenzo replied casually when he heard those words. As soon as he heard Kenzo's response, the driver immediately pulled over to the side. Was that it? Kenzo was puzzled, not understanding why he wanted to watch a women's fight. The driver took out some bills and said in a serious tone, Since we're not in a hurry, let's watch this beautiful battle. Care to place a bet? Kenzo smiled confidently and asked, How much are you willing to lose? Chapter 15, The Outcome of a Bet The confident Kenzo had placed a bet on a woman in shorts, but she ended up being knocked out by the other woman, and that was the end of the bet. After this little episode, he finally returned to the old cafe. We're here, and along with the bet, it's a total of 9,600 yen. After stopping the taxi, the driver pointed to the meter and stated the amount, adding the bet. You're in luck. Kenzo reached for his pocket with a calm look, but his expression turned serious when he realized that his damn wallet was missing. What's going on? Kenzo's face was solemn, and he suddenly remembered the boy he had bumped into earlier, taking his umbrella in the process. After careful consideration, Kenzo smiled the more he thought about it. It turns out that kid had dared to steal from him, and it seemed he was there for other reasons. Thinking about it a bit more, could that kid also be part of the CCG? If so, things would get a little more interesting. Hey, friend, what's wrong? The taxi driver suddenly became uncomfortable with Kenzo's silence. Wait a minute, I'll have someone pay for me. Kenzo said with a serene look, then opened the door and exited the taxi. The taxi driver wasn't in a hurry, so he waited in the car, feeling like the guy who had just gotten out was someone who pays his debts. When Kenzo reached the cafe's door, he immediately gestured to Tuka who was not far from his position. Tuka was working, and when she saw Kenzo at the door, she didn't know what the hell was going on, so she approached, confused. What's wrong? Why are you at the door? Tuka came out wearing her apron. In the cafe, the manager also looked at Kenzo, who was at the door, and his face showed the same confusion. My dear Tuka, I just got back by taxi and didn't pay, so I need you to pay for me. Kenzo pointed to the taxi not far away and told her. What? Tuka froze for a moment, had this man become this familiar this quickly? My wallet was stolen. In short, please go and pay for me first. Kenzo said, turning around and leaving again. Where are you going now? Seeing Kenzo leave again, Tuka asked in an unsatisfied tone. I know who stole my wallet, so I'm going to get it back. The wallet contains some of my most precious belongings. Fortunately, you have my credit card, so they can only steal the cash. Kenzo said without looking back. You, really? Took a listen to the most loving words a girlfriend could say to her newly found boyfriend and rubbed her forehead in frustration. You guys have quite a relationship. It's a total of 9,600 yen. The taxi driver reminded the angry Tuka with a slight concern in his tone. Why so much? Tuka yelled, making sure her question was heard by Kenzo who simply quickened his steps. The taxi driver watched as his betting companion had rushed away, and he paled slightly. After clearing his throat, he said, Your fiancé and I made a bet. Adding the meter fare, it resulted in this sum. Tuka looked coldly at the taxi driver and asked with a friendly smile, If you tell me what you bet on, I'll pay it. If you don't, I'll only pay the meter fare. Oh, that's... The taxi driver, in a difficult situation, finally said, we bet while watching a women's fight. It's not very empathetic, but we only watched the fight while waiting at a red light. Is that so? Tuka smiled as she thought about her boyfriend's adventures. Every day, she discovered new things about him. Who would have thought he was so into gambling? At the same time, the taxi driver secretly thought that Kenzo had a dispute with his boyfriend and was trying to take a taxi to the store where his fiancé worked and then asked her to pay. Is this a new way to flirt? This operation really surprised the taxi driver. Of course, this is what the taxi driver thought. 
Tuka had no choice but to take out a small rabbit patterned purse and then reluctantly paid the fare and that silly bet. Back at the cafe, Koma NG asked, What happened? Why did he leave again? He's very unlucky. He went for a walk and then had his wallet stolen. Tuka said these words through clenched teeth. Oh. Everyone was stunned when they heard this news. Even the manager, Yashimura, looked intrigued. How could his son have let himself get robbed? Who would have thought that Kenzo, who went for a walk, would end up having his wallet stolen? He's certainly very unlucky. I wouldn't wish that feeling on my worst enemy. Koma NG shook his head while cleaning some cups. Haha, now you're worried about him. Tuka couldn't help but laugh because she thought Kenzo was too mysterious to be understood by her, despite having observed him for a long time. Hey. When I was a kid, I had my money stolen. That feeling is very uncontrollable. Koma NG refuted the teasing of everyone. It's well known that he disciplined Kenzo a lot out of his love for him. Seeing everyone laughing, Tuka smiled warmly. Our dear Tuka is afraid someone will steal her boyfriend? You shouldn't worry now, nobody would want to be with a slacker like him. At that moment, Irimi Kaya smiled warmly while making these remarks. Cough. Cough. Upon hearing such open declarations, Tuka coughed a bit to calm her blushing face. Is she in love with that slacker? Koma NG suddenly erupted in anger. He was like a father to Tuka and wouldn't allow her to be with a slacker. Ah! What nonsense are you talking about? Tuka glared at them both angrily. This kind of question made her feel embarrassed and annoyed, especially now that the store manager was looking at her with a slight smile, thinking about what had happened the previous night. Irimi Kaya smiled slightly, leaned closer to Tuka's ear, and said softly, Well, then you have to do your best, he might end up leaving us at this rate. Oh, really? If he does, I'll drag him back. Tuka smiled coldly as she imagined the beating she would give Kenzo, and everyone was left in shock. All right, you two ladies, it's time to work. Koma NG intervened in this strange conversation. The conversation came to a halt, and Tuka didn't let it affect her too much. She knew that Kenzo wouldn't just walk away without a reason. He wasn't a man who lied, so if he said she was the only one for him, there was nothing to worry about. At that moment, in the CCG branch of District 20. An ordinary human? Doesn't seem like it. Suzuya Jozo held Kenzo's materials and touched his chin in thought. However, judging by his behavior, there's really nothing remarkable about it. Although a report is usually important, it can end up being a joke. After all, there's nothing that screams mysterious man, said an investigator named Umeno Masami. Do you believe that too? Suzuya Jozo was interested in this. Shinohara Yukinori, who was in the meeting, thought for a moment and said, according to the investigation, it seems that the report was made hastily, so we can't conclude that he's really a ghoul. Indeed, this guy looks quite decent if he's not a ghoul. We have information on him from before. It seems he was raised by his grandfather, who passed away not long ago, and because of that, the man's studies began to decline. Something normal, I guess. If my only loved one died, I suppose I'd break down in a similar or even worse way. Shinohara Yukinori knew that the reports were mostly inaccurate, but they wouldn't overlook this source of information that pointed to Kenzo as a ghoul. Chapter 16, The Source of Information Umeno Masami came from District 14 to District 20 because many of his targets were disappearing after entering this sector. He couldn't help but feel curiosity, fear, and a sense of not being in control while patrolling the streets in this place. The sensation in District 20 for expert investigators is like a quagmire. No matter how prepared they are in this place, they inevitably never have control over what happens here. Even if they were asked directly, what is the most dangerous district of all? He would definitely answer that District 20 is due to its organization that keeps it off the radar. It's a shame that the higher UPS don't approve a large-scale investigation into the places where the ghouls in this district might be and how they feed if not by hunting their victims similarly to other sectors. We must move carefully in this sector, everyone seems ignorant, but they know perfectly well that the biggest problem is District 20. At the moment, it's just one sector that's supposedly free of ghouls, and no one seems to question how that's possible. They ignore the fact that it's one well-organized organization in the sector. If they all manage to adapt in that way, they would be in the dark, and we would be in the light. Many speculate that District 20 has fewer ghouls than the others, but are we right to think that there is an organization that controls everything in the shadows? Umeno Masami seemed the darkest to this idea, 
so he earned the nickname of the Ghoul Censor, ironically because he is never correct. Shinohara Yukinori seemed to understand, the emergence of an organization of ghouls that can hide and dominate a sector of human society would have serious and complex consequences. It would create a climate of fear, distrust, and violence, and could lead to a dangerous confrontation between humans and ghouls at unexpected times. The response of human society would be a fundamental issue, as it could determine the course of events and the fate of both species. They are giving us a choice, at least in this place, they are giving us a choice of what we want to do. Domeno looked at Captain Shinohara Yukinori with perplexity, what was he trying to say? Shinohara Yukinori noticed the bewildered looks of everyone around him and said, Haha, don't misunderstand me, what I mean is that we have the final say on what will happen in this place. If we bite forcefully with the intention of killing, they will strike back in the same way. I hadn't thought of it before. Domeno Masami held his forehead with a very doubtful expression. If they choose war or no war, isn't it very difficult for them to choose either option? If they choose no war, everything will continue the same in District 20, where supposedly peace reigns, there are no missing people, and ghoul attacks are extremely rare, as the last one was just yesterday. Now, if they decide to attack, all the ghouls in unknown locations may come out and attack humans, an organized strike hurts more than a brute one. That's what's at stake in this place. I'm back. At this moment, Suzuya Jozo approached in small hops, holding a coffee behind his hands. Oh. Sorry for not greeting you earlier. You are Shinohara Yukinori's partner, right? Suzuya Jozo, if I'm not mistaken. Domeno Masami greeted with a friendly smile. Shinohara Yukinori also looked at Suzuya Jozo, the investigator who had been transferred from District 13. He didn't know much about him until now. But everyone knew Shinohara Yukinori, especially Domeno, who had transferred from District 14 to 20 by his own choice. He knew who the captain of this division was, and he didn't expect a kid to be his partner from now on. It's well known that Shinohara Yukinori, although he's ranked one and is still considered a ghoul investigator, is, in fact, already a special class investigator and is about to become the CCG commander in District 20. I heard you got a good lead on the suspicious target in District 20, right? Shinohara Yukinori asked at this moment. The target they were talking about was naturally Kenzo who had been reported by an anonymous source announcing that he was a powerful ghoul. Although Kenzo's reputation in District 20 is blank, so much so that even his father didn't know he was the leader of the Three Eyes Raven organization, very few knew he was a ghoul, and you could count them on one hand. Not only do his enemies die shortly after coming into contact with him, but also most of the high-ranking members of his organization only know about his Kagun. His sister can't even imagine that he's the leader of the Three Eyes Raven organization because he has two completely different mastered Kaguns. The one he uses as the leader of the organization is a wing similar to a demon, and his identity as Kenzo simply uses his huge right arm. Yes, I received the mission, and I was about to tell you about it, but they started talking about many things, to the point that I got hungry and went to buy something. Suzuya Jozo revealed some information found in Kenzo's wallet, obviously keeping the money and the wallet in his pocket. But at that moment, a guard who was standing at the entrance of the CCG branch rushed in. Mr. Kurio, something is happening at the entrance of the branch. A person entered, beating the guards, claiming to be looking for someone. A security guard ran in, looking extremely worried that it might be a ghoul attack. Eh? What nonsense are you talking about? Is someone crazy enough to come to a CCG branch to cause trouble? Domeno Masami jumped up in confusion. Let's check that out first. Shinohara Yukinori didn't have time to see the documents Kenzo had in his wallet, to be honest, there was nothing compromising in it, but if they decided to start an investigation there, it would certainly cause problems. He wanted to go see what was happening first. At that moment, outside the CCG's door, a group of people lay on the ground as Kenzo walked through the main entrance. There were even several Class II ghoul investigators on the ground. When they stood in front of Kenzo, no one could stop him for more than five seconds before being knocked down. Among them was Kautoro Amon, who was a rookie investigator, but he was crushed by a combination of Kenzo's blows. This terrible scene shocked everyone present. Call the person in charge here. I have limited patience. If they arrive late, I might just smash all the guards in this place. Kenzo scratched his ear while kicking an investigator who was attempting to bite him. Hey, are you a dog or what? This idiot. At that moment, one by one, they all retreated while clenching their teeth. Boom. At this moment, 
a strange sound rang out, and a gas similar to vapor emerged from one of Kenzo's feet. It was a kind of pepper spray gas. Kenzo might be very random to many, but this would deter any suspicions about him. Humans are naturally curious, the more someone acts normal, the more others will be drawn to the place where there is nothing. But Kenzo knew that no sensible ghoul would come to the CCG branch looking for trouble, especially a ghoul who could be caught by dozens of investigators in this place. However, Kenzo trusted his instincts, and the actions he was taking were justified, otherwise, he wouldn't be foolish enough to rush into a situation he didn't control. Boom! Kenzo kicked the grenade that was mercilessly thrown at him, hitting an investigator ghoul on the forehead, and many of the investigators were suddenly affected. This bastard! Is he insane? Damn it! An investigator gritted his teeth because his partner had been knocked out by Kenzo. How could there be a person like this? It should be known that ghoul investigators are rigorously trained in combat techniques, situational analysis, and perception. Not all of them are capable of taking on a ghoul with superhuman strength and winning, but they should be stronger than most average civilians. Despite that, an ordinary man had entered a CCG branch very easily. How could they defend themselves if dozens of ghouls arrived to attack them? Listen, my body has been trained until it bleeds, and none of you can match my perfection. You won't be rivals for me, so call the person in charge. Kenzo, with a tired look, continued walking, ignoring the investigators. Wow! At that moment, Umeno Masami emerged with many investigators behind him, clapping his hands, My god, you are truly skilled. If I guess correctly, you couldn't possibly be an excellent ghoul investigator. Um... Kenzo looked at the ghoul investigator who seemed somewhat different from the others. Umeno Masami is tall, strong, and has a solemn attitude. It can be seen that he is an excellent investigator with a respectful and polite demeanor, but behind that facade is someone very powerful. You know who I am, don't you? Kenzo looked at the other side and said with no expression. Of course, so many things have been happening in District 20 recently. We received a report pointing to you as a suspect but it was unexpected that you would come to us, said Umeno Masami with a cold smile. I suspected it. Kenzo thought as he continued his act. Oh, I lost my wallet, and it's in this place. I wanted to come and ask politely, but your guards wanted to kick me out of here. Do you know how much tax I pay for you to have these fancy facilities? Kenzo pointed to all the ghoul investigators in front of him and declared, if I announce this on social media, do you think you'll be in control of the situation? Uh. You lost your wallet? Shouldn't you call the police? Umeno Masami was obviously puzzled. Do you want me to call the police? I probably will, just wait a moment. Kenzo took out his cell phone and dialed the police directly, Hello, yes, at the CCG branch, an investigator stole my wallet and refuses to return it. Of course, I will call my lawyers and file a lawsuit. When everyone heard these words, they were a bit confused and didn't know what Kenzo meant at this moment. Did one of the employees steal a wallet from this expert martial artist? Chapter 17, Making a Scene Is he calling the police? He's completely insane, did a ghoul investigator really steal a civilian's wallet? Wait, isn't he a ghoul? No, they say he came through the main entrance, so he definitely went through the scanner, he's not a ghoul. The situation suddenly became extremely concerning for everyone. If this situation goes public, they would become widely known for resolving it. It should be known that most of the taxes are going directly to the CCG departments, and although public opinion is necessary, it's highly controversial. What if the people they save start believing they would become a progressively increasing threat? In this situation, if what Kenzo is saying is true, then it would be the right thing to call the police. However, if he's not telling the truth, then he must have some serious mental issues. But then, Umeno Masami smiled, took a small step forward, and pulled out a wallet. They needed to control the situation as quickly as possible, the last thing they wanted was to tarnish their reputation with such a ridiculous scandal. Uh. Is this it? After seeing it, Umeno Masami almost guessed what this whole scandal was about. Yes, well, if you want it back, then come and take it from my hand. Can't you do that? Suzuya Jozo took the wallet from Umeno and provocatively glanced at Kenzo. Hey, who told you to do these foolish things? You're an investigator, how can you do such a thing? After understanding the truth of the matter, Suzuya Jozo couldn't help but scold him. They knew that Suzuya Jozo had obtained much more sophisticated information from Kenzo, 
but they didn't expect this foolish kid to actually steal the other party's wallet. Hat. Interesting. Kenzo, out of the corner of his eye, saw some police officers rushing toward the entrance of the CCG and did nothing. He simply took out his phone, showed the audio recording, and said, My lawyers will take care of this situation. I can't believe you are all doing this to me. Don't you know that, in addition to paying taxes, I make incredibly large donations to the families of deceased investigators? I have a charity where I raise donations, help affected families, and give more than I receive from all of you. Kenzo's words began to affect the people around him, no one knew who Kenzo was, but if his words were true, they would be highly controversial if they spread. What was supposed to be happening in this place? This branch is going to be in the news. I don't understand the point of being in the 20th district if there are so few ghouls. You should be supporting other more affected districts instead of wasting time here. You're a bunch of useless men who are now wasting time stealing wallets. Kenzo looked at everyone with anger, as if he had truly lost his mind. One of the nearby ghoul investigators got up from the ground and shouted, You damn fool, you have no idea what you're saying. Boom. Letting himself be hit, Kenzo fell to the ground with fake tears streaming down his cheek. His performance was memorable, worthy of a special award. Because right at that moment, a detective and several police officers entered and witnessed the scene. What's going on here? The officers who suddenly saw a man in a suit hitting another person immediately stepped forward to calm the situation. They stole my wallet, I don't know the reasons, but they should be arrested. Kenzo stood up as if he hadn't just been punched in the face and stood behind the police officer. This is a bit. The police officer wasn't exactly sure what to do. He looked around to see if he could find someone in charge, but no one stepped forward to remedy the situation. Don't be afraid, officer. I have information that incriminates them, so my lawyers will handle the lawsuit. What they just did is theft, unfounded accusations, physical violence that endangers my life, and psychological harm, Kenzo said while pointing at all the ghoul investigators. This scoundrel. Hey, have you seen this, officer? They're the damn aggressors you must arrest them all. Kenzo smiled slightly under the cover of the police officer, after seeing the disgusted expressions of everyone. What are you talking about? You came in hitting the security guard, assaulted many ghoul investigators, and it seems like you had no intention of stopping until the police arrived. Shinohara Yukinori then arrived from the back and saw all the commotion that was unfolding. What's the situation? The police officer stepped forward and said, Sir, this man here is claiming that a ghoul investigator stole his wallet, although that sounds a bit. Are you saying I'm lying? Kenzo's cold voice became much deeper as he said, Wait, did my crazy lover inform you that I'm a damn filthy ghoul? For God's sake, what we had was a mistake because she was 45 years old. I didn't expect them to tell you such nonsense. Shinohara Yukinori smiled kindly and said, Unfortunately, one of my employees made that drastic move, we're very sorry. But if I may be so bold, I would like to request that you don't take legal action against us. Civilians may not know this, but we must resort to unconventional methods to continue finding ghouls. Then give me back my wallet, and I'd also like to clarify the misunderstanding regarding the suspicions raised against me. Although it doesn't bother me, it would be much less work for you if I cooperate with whatever is needed to avoid unnecessary suspicions after all, I'm a human, I believe, ha ha ha. Kenzo's joke made everyone turn to look at him. Such a joke in this kind of situation is extremely delicate, considering he's a suspected ghoul. Shinohara Yukinori smiled and said, We appreciate your cooperation. Once again, I apologize for the unpleasant actions one of our employees resorted to in a mission where they were only supposed to gather information, not engage in physical confrontation. The Meno Masami walked forward and, after placing all the items back in Kenzo's wallet, he pointed to an RC scanning door that was a few dozen meters from their position. Everyone, upon realizing that an unbreakable test was about to take place, grew more nervous because if he turned out to be a ghoul, an inevitable battle would erupt inside the CCG branch. When Kenzo received his wallet, he opened it, and everything was indeed inside it. Taking a picture, he showed it to Shinohara Yukinori and said, My mother, isn't she beautiful? Truly a beauty. How is she doing now? Shinohara Yukinori asked as he walked closer to Kenzo with no concern. She's dead, she was killed by ghouls when I was just a baby. She was very brave, a journalist who was investigating a group of ghouls after giving birth to me. Unfortunately, in the letter she left me, she mentioned that she had been discovered, 
so she was killed shortly after. Kenzo didn't lie in this story, he didn't want to win talking about his mother. He needed a letter to further persuade the ghoul investigators, and his mother, from whom he had never needed anything, helped him in this situation. With this, he was sure he had convinced them all. If he now passed through the scanning door and came out clean, that meant he would be free from suspicion for some time. If he were suddenly discovered, the cafe and everyone working there would be eliminated by the CCG without hesitation. A surprise attack is not what they expect, so as long as he gets rid of the humans, he can figure out who reported him to the CCG. I'm very sorry, but surely your mother died protecting not only you but many others who are constantly in danger of ghoul attacks. Please, go through the scanner, Shinohara Yukinori said with a somewhat pale expression. Yes. Kenzo, even though he was acting, didn't do it completely. Although he was a ghoul, he understood humans perfectly but also knew that if he were suddenly discovered as a ghoul, they wouldn't hesitate to lock him up. To deal with humans, you must treat them with the same tools, weapons, and methods to persuade them. What he was doing right now was playing with their minds, empathy, and feelings. How many comrades have they seen die on the battlefield while dealing with ghouls? My mother died doing what she loved, her bravery still fills me with strength. That's why I got upset when she found out that the person who stole my wallet was one of the ghoul investigators, I didn't want to tarnish my mother's name. Kenzo took a step forward, and the scanner showed no alarm, indicating that he was only a human. When Shinohara Yukinori saw this, he sighed wearily, walked up to Kenzo, and said, I will make sure to discipline the ghoul investigators properly. Don't worry about anything else. Kenzo smiled and shook his head, those you should punish are the ones who played that prank. I'm not sure if it's that old lady, but I would be fascinated if you caught her. Rest assured. Shinohara Yukinori bid farewell to Kenzo, and after seeing him leave the building, he touched his temple with a headache. He wasn't a ghoul? Then where did he get the strength to hit so many guards? Umeno Masami asked, bewildered. Have you not seen his body? Although he's human, he's been trained since he could and we'll probably see him in our ranks killing ghouls very soon because his eyes show nothing but a very persistent thirst for revenge. Shinohara Yukinori turned around and yelled, Suzuya Juzo, if you're going to steal wallets, make sure you don't get caught, you idiot. Humans are more foolish than I expected, I gave them a chance to catch my brother, and instead of that, they let him go. Ito watched her brother walk out of the CCG and shook her head. She was the one who informed the CCG that her brother was a ghoul. Her plan was for them to catch him, and then she would release him herself and make him understand the importance of being together. Unfortunately, her brother was more skilled than expected and resolved his situation in less than a day, something she admired a lot. Yes, I suppose everything I did is foolish, but, doesn't that show how clever my dear brother is? If only he weren't so grumpy and listened to me. Chapter 18, We Can Discuss That Wait a moment, sir, we'll take you home said a police officer who had responded to Kenzo's call. It's not necessary, officer, you can carry on with your work. Kenzo now wanted to stay off the radar for a while, so arriving at the cafe in a police car would be very conspicuous. The police officer, who appeared to be in his forties, shook his head and said, I insist on taking you. It was a request from a ghoul investigator, so it's more than just work to take you home. Are they going to tail him again? None of his information is linked to the cafe. Perhaps that's why they wanted to follow him. Thinking it through, Kenzo gave the police officer an address that was his old home where he lived with his grandfather. While ghoul attacks are not very frequent in the 20th district, we're never exempt from being their victims. Many people tend to be afraid of not having control over the unknown, and this is no exception. Who knows where ghouls hide? The police officer driving shared this with Kenzo while shaking his head. Many find it more comfortable for ghouls to be unrestrained than hidden. Places where nothing unusual happens are often more terrifying because they may be much more dangerous areas. The cop sitting in the passenger seat nodded and mentioned this information he'd heard on a website. Isn't it the other way around? Kenzo asked, looking ahead. What do you mean? It's often rare to see ghouls being so calm in the districts. If that happens in the 20th district, it's because something keeps them under control. Isn't that better than seeing destruction everywhere we go? Many districts aren't as lucky as ours, that's why the population is increasing in our area. Kenzo opened a chocolate bar he had in one of his bags and said, My humble thought, a tough and bitter war against them would only bring painful deaths. You're right about that, 
but how long do you think the peace will last in this district? True, there won't always be peace. Kenzo smiled and thought to himself, peace will last until you humans strike first. You'll have to learn that not all wars will be won by crushing the enemy, as you've done so far. On the way, Kenzo pondered who might have betrayed him, and the only person who comes to mind is his sister. Even if he doesn't spend much time with the ghouls from her organization, they know that everything is happening because of him, so it's impossible for them to initiate contact with their main enemy in their eyes. If he thinks about it more closely, not even the V organization has knowledge of his real appearance, making it difficult to speculate that it was them. Most likely, it was his sister or the ghoul accompanying her who caused this disaster. Fortunately, he acted promptly, otherwise, things could have gone very wrong. He would not only lose a large portion of his business branches registered in his name, but all those connected to him would be hunted. Whoever did this has messed with a force they can't handle, so when he finds out who betrayed him, he'll kill them. What just happened now may go unnoticed by his father, Yashimura, and even less by Tuka, the matter wasn't as serious as they might think. We've arrived. Said the police officer after seeing Kenzo's old house, he smiled and said, have a pleasant evening. We're sorry for what happened, so we hope you can resolve all your issues and avoid going out at night for your safety. Kenzo smiled and nodded, then said, you two, officers, stay strong and avoid getting hurt. The old Japanese house where Kenzo has memories with his late adoptive father is a wonderful example of traditional Japanese architecture from the modern era. The house is located in a peaceful setting and surrounded by a meticulously maintained Japanese garden. The house's facade is simple and elegant, constructed from dark wood that has acquired an aging patina over time. The gabled roof, typical of architecture in old houses, is covered with ceramic tiles of rusty red color. The exterior of the house features subtle decorative details, such as sliding shoji paper doors that allow natural light to enter. Upon crossing the threshold of the house, Kenzo saw Jenkin, a small entryway where visitors are expected to remove their shoes before entering the interior areas. The interior walls are lined with washi paper, which filters light softly and creates a warm and serene atmosphere inside. I'm back, sir. Kenzo smelled the soft, characteristic scent of tatami mats that permeated the air. In the center of one of the rooms, there's a tokonoma, a decorative alcove in the wall, where there was a photo of him and his adoptive father. The sound of water flowing in a small zen garden near an open window provides a relaxing soundtrack to the environment. So lonely, I understand why he took me back. Kenzo thought of his real father. The memories Kenzo holds in this house are filled with nostalgia and affection for his adoptive father. Every corner of the house evokes special moments shared between them, and the garden offers a space for contemplation and peace that reflects the deep connection they had. But now that he sees it, it's clearly a lonely place that he can't share with anyone. However, when Kenzo thought about it, he remembered Tuka. Maybe in the future. A few hours later, Kenzo left his house where normally a lady took care of the garden and the fish that inhabited the small artificial pond around the high walls that kept the outside from view. After changing his clothes, Kenzo decided to return to the cafe, but due to various things, he was running late. Kenzo, is everything okay? Tuka suddenly asked him as she watched him enter. Yes, I'm sorry for worrying you. I'm here to help with the night shift, Kenzo, with his characteristic tired look, smiled at Tuka, who was just inches away from him. When Tuka felt a hand touch her hip, she quickly moved away and said, that's perfect. Mr. Koma will be out today because he has important matters to attend to, so your help would be appreciated. Manager Yashimura looked at these two young people with a smile and his thoughts drifted back to a time when he deeply fell in love with his late wife, even when he acted colder than Kenzo. Love, it's incredible how love always changes people, manager Yashimura muttered as he prepared several cups of coffee. Hey, I want a cup of coffee. Kenzo, who was supposed to help with work, served himself a cup of coffee as the first thing. He had to admit it, his father had an enviable technique in the art of coffee. Hey, didn't you say you'd work? This is a quality control test, my dear Tuka. All business owners do it. Kenzo affectionately patted the head of the grumpy Tuka, who was searching for any detail to argue with him, but he took it simply as a tantrum for not explaining things to her. Tuka gave Kenzo's hand a little pat and said in an annoyed tone, Have you lost 10,000 yen in a bet watching two women fighting? Cough cough. Kenzo almost choked on his coffee and, after looking around, shook his head. It was the lady's cats not the ladies themselves. You're a terrible liar. 
Tuka went into the storeroom to fetch some needed boxes, and because there weren't many people around, Kenzo followed her. Well, I can tell you that the lady I bet on was extremely tall and weighed three times more than her opponent. If you saw it the way I did, you'd bet on the same one I did. Kenzo lifted a box that Tuka couldn't reach. I'm not interested. Tuka was about to turn around when Kenzo held her shoulders and kissed her, but a few minutes later, she felt a strong bite that took a piece of her tongue. Are you a dog? Kenzo yelled with a bloody mouth and pointed, I don't have regeneration like you. Well, it still hurts. Tuka blushed but showed a dignified expression and said, No kissing at work. But you liked it. You're mistaken. Chapter 19, The Crow's Move Canoe General Hospital After the steel beams incident, an urgent surgery was performed in the hospital, transplanting Riz Kamishiro's organs from the deceased patient into Ken Kanaki, the surviving patient who remains in a coma, or at least that's what we know so far. Falcon, your mission is to capture the doctor and ensure you obtain the relevant information before he leaves the hospital. Additionally, Ken Kanaki's case is to be transferred to the private Black Moon Hospital under our care. In a large, dark truck, the fifth pillar in the hierarchy of high command, Tezo, looked at the numerous screens in front of him and sipped a special wine created solely for ghouls. It's surprising they send me on these boring missions. If they had sent any of the lower nine pillars, I'm sure they would have completed this mission successfully. Tezo, a rather bulky ghoul, complained as he struck the desk with force. A man with round glasses, spiky hair and a black suit beside him responded to Tezo in a highly formal tone, My Lord Tezo, you hold the fifth pillar position not just for your strength but for your skill in special missions. Haven't you read the report? It's not only about kidnapping two people but also finding out how that boy named Kanaki survived with ghoul organs transferred into his body. If we take Dr. Kanu directly, we'll know what he's plotting. It's unbelievable, how dare he conduct those experiments in District 20. Tezo shook his head and reclined in his seat. Tezo appeared to be a young man with dark brown, short, slightly wavy hair. His distinctive feature was his narrow, brown eyes, which earned him the title of the lone crow within the organization, something he despised. His kagun was a rinkaku, and his rank was SS compared to other ghouls. It's worth mentioning that neither he nor the other pillars resorted to cannibalism to increase their power. On the contrary, they trained rigorously and maintained strict diets to continue increasing their strength. How is the weapon deal going? Tezo asked in a bored tone. Leorio adjusted his glasses and mumbled, Mr. Barbosa should handle it. After all, it's just a matter of receiving the weapons from Europe, nothing out of the ordinary. But I wanted to go. Tezo loved the sea, and the delivery was supposed to be by sea, but a senseless mission from his perspective arose, diverting his plans. Inside the hospital, a squad of twenty crows, half of whom were ghouls and the rest humans, infiltrated the hospital from different directions, awaiting Captain Falcon to take charge of the doctor. There weren't many human staff around, and the security wasn't particularly high, as it was just a common hospital. This greatly facilitated the mission, and Falcon was able to enter the waiting room outside Dr. Canoe's office. So far, all clear. Maintain your positions, Falcon whispered. Falcon has an intimidating appearance. He is bald by choice, with slightly tanned skin, light brown eyes, and a deep gaze that quickly caught the attention of people around him. A nurse named Taguchi immediately approached Falcon and asked in a friendly tone, Excuse me, sir. Do you have an appointment with Dr. Kanu? Falcon looked up and, noticing the dwindling number of patients, nodded. He then spoke directly, Of course. Could you kindly lead me to him? I'm sorry, but could you give me your name to look up on the client list? Nurse Taguchi initially smiled amiably, but after seeing a pistol in Falcon's jacket, her face turned pale. Excuse my bluntness, I'm with the CCG, and I need to meet with Dr. Kanu immediately. Would you be so kind as to take me to him? Right now. I, I don't think I can. Taguchi slowly stepped back as if what Falcon was asking was much more than she could offer. It's not a request, Miss Taguchi. If you don't do exactly what I'm asking, your chances of getting out of this alive are diminishing by the second. You may have been very kind, but you know why I'm here, given your involvement in that surgery. Do you want to be implicated right now? Falcon's penetrating gaze and gravelly voice left Taguchi terrified, and she immediately told him to follow her as she moved towards the doctor's office. Just get in already. Do you think I'm playing games? I'm sorry, forgive me. 
Taguchi had just been thinking that something like this would happen, after all, they had transplanted ghoul organs into a human, and it was normal that they would be caught shortly after. Before she opened the door, it was pushed open from the inside, and Dr. Kanu escorted one of his patients to the door. When his gaze met Taguchi's, he frowned. He quickly focused on the man beside her and asked, Do you have an appointment? If not, you won't be able to enter. I think we're not understanding each other. I didn't come here for an appointment, but specifically to speak with you. Falcon drew his pistol and said, Now, let's go inside and talk, or things will get a little out of hand. Come in. Dr. Kanu looked at Falcon coldly and gave in to the threats. Falcon smiled and said, No need to sit down, it will all be over soon. Dr. Kanu, we've been following your steps for the past few days. We know what you've done with Kanaki and others. Now, you have two options, you can leave here peacefully and come with me, or we can do it the hard way, in a bloodbath. Dr. Kanu furrowed his brow, unsure of what was happening. He tried to calm the situation, saying, I only saved a life, that's all we did in the surgery on young Kanaki. Don't play games with me, Dr. Kanu. Alive or dead, I was ordered to take you back. Your actions threaten the stability of the human ghoul worlds, so to learn more about your research, you'll have to come with me. You must understand that my research is of vital importance to human evolution. My methods may seem unusual, but they serve a higher purpose, Dr. Kanu seemed to lose his composure for a moment. In a sarcastic tone, Falcon said, a higher purpose, you say? Turning humans into monsters, into ghouls? That's what you're doing, isn't it? Dr. Kanu nodded and muttered, yes, but... Falcon interrupted the conversation, saying, I don't care. You will transfer Kanaki to the private Black Moon Hospital. You can choose to cooperate and leave here with clean hands, or I can guarantee that you won't take another breath without shedding blood. Dr. Kanu, trying to buy time to figure out what to do, said, You don't understand, please let me explain. No need for explanations. We've investigated enough. You and I know what you've done. Now, what will it be? Peaceful exit or a bloody one? Falcon was only tasked with taking this doctor transferring Kanaki to their hospital, and taking away or eliminating those involved. There was nothing else he cared about. Come on, there's no other way, is there? Falcon looked at the nurse and told her, you'll come with us too. Chapter 20, Changes of Plans What happens with the world in many aspects is that a person never finds their place until some time after they've lived. Everyone knocks on doors from one place to another until they find the sweet spot in life. Many take advantage of those who have not yet found their way, and this often leads to somewhat disastrous accidents. In the early days, Kenzo approached the right people and quickly formed a group that started with simple assassination jobs. As ghouls, their primary function is to kill and eat, but if they turn that into a money-making job, things become much more productive. In this regard, starting from the beginning, everything was much simpler. But after all the dirty work, the money needed to be laundered, and there was no better way than nightclubs, restaurants, museums, and a unique system tailored to ghouls. Kenzo was a pro at creating a beautiful, peaceful, and sustainable world for many who didn't know how to survive. Because all his businesses were nightlife based, he soon became known as Crow. His nickname grew so large that it quickly changed to Crow Master, and for others, the Three-Eyed Crow organization was officially formed. Many wanted to live, but they didn't find the right way to do it and their aggressive education turned them into real obstacles once they started training. Black Moon Hospital is a perfect front for one of Kenzo's organization's most sophisticated and secretive bases known as the Three-Eyed Crow. On the surface, it appears to be a high-end private hospital with an impeccable reputation for treating rare diseases and complex medical conditions. However, beneath the surface lies a web of illegal activities and clandestine operations that no one would expect from ghouls. The underground tunnels snaking beneath the hospital are an intricate maze of secret passages and chambers. Ghouls who needed to control their cocoon perfectly would create new passages by excavating the earth. These tunnels serve as a super research facility where dark and twisted experiments are conducted, aiming to perfect their abilities and develop new ways to blend in with humans. Here, ethical medical practices become unimaginable horrors for many humans as ghouls study human biology and physiology in grotesque ways. If humans create a door that detects the cells that compose a ghoul, here, they research how to conceal the cells to remain undetected. Furthermore, a major research area is to find ways to live off other energy sources, far from human flesh. 
the Three-Eyed Crows base at Luna Negra Hospital also functions as a human food distribution center, providing ghouls with the vital sustenance they need to survive without arousing suspicion. Human meat supplies are transported through the underground tunnels, where they are prepared and distributed meticulously. But the network of illegal activities doesn't stop there. The First Order Crows, as they are known within the organization, venture deeper than any human could imagine. These extremely dangerous and committed ghouls are engaged in arms trafficking, drug trade, and many other illicit activities. They use the underground tunnels as a route for smuggling and clandestine distribution of these goods to other locations. The money that can be made is unimaginable by trafficking heroin to countries like South Korea, where drug control is high. Additionally, arms sales are only acceptable as long as it involves a country other than Japan. The last thing Kenzo wants is to have trouble with the same weapons he has sold, so he'd prefer not to sell them at all than to face bothersome complications later. Kenzo knows that it's not necessary to be on an island to have their bases. The closer they are to heavily populated cities, the more chances they have of escaping if they are ever attacked or discovered by the CCG. In this case, their medical facade and their position in the medical world serve as the perfect mask to cover the secret activities taking place inside, where the line between life and death, research, and cruelty, is entirely blurred. Send the frozen food to the restaurants for proper distribution, be careful with that product, it'll be costly if we mishandle it. Viper was distributing tons of food to various restaurants for their respective deliveries to special areas and homes where families were waiting to be fed. At that moment, a figure appeared wearing a black crow mask and said, Sir, the fifth pillar, Tezo, has arrived with the targets. Viper nodded and simply waved his hand for the figure to step aside, then took out a phone and dialed a very special number. Crow Master, he's here. Yes, we'll take it into account. A few kilometers away, Kenzo looked at his assistant and said, Luna Negra Hospital, despite being a private institution, has implemented a very particular strategy to attract and gain the community's trust. Do you know what we do here? The young man named Number One nodded and said in a robotic tone, it offers completely free medical consultations to anyone in need, regardless of their economic status. Only for international patients are fees applied, but for the local population, everything is absolutely free. You're right, a wonderful explanation, but I can sense that you don't know why we do this. Kenzo lit a cigarette and said, This seemingly altruistic approach has proven to be an extremely effective tool for brainwashing people and concealing our clandestine activities. Money is important, but people's opinions about companies, organizations, and their owners matter even more. Envy is reflected in how you act, but if, Instead of that, you give more than you receive, then you'll have control over the board. The free consultations create a strong emotional bond with the local community, which sees Luna Negra Hospital as a benevolent institution concerned about the population's well-being. Patients feel grateful for receiving quality medical care at no cost, generating unwavering loyalty toward the hospital and its supposed humanitarian values. In addition, this strategy serves to conceal the illegal activities and movements of the organization that take place in the hospital's underground tunnels. By providing free medical care, Luna Negra Hospital manages to divert the attention of the authorities and the public opinion. Free medical consultations act as a smokescreen that hides the inhumane practices and dark experiments carried out in the depths of the institution. Kenzo smoked just to pass the time, as there weren't many things that held his attention besides gambling. The local population, mostly unaware of what truly happens in the hospital, fervently defends its existence and unwittingly contributes to its cover-up. The message sent is clear, Luna Negra Hospital is there to help, and the horror stories circulating in the underground hallways remain hidden behind the facade of free medical care. This mind-washing strategy has allowed us to operate effectively in the shadows, leveraging the loyalty and gratitude of the local community to keep their dark secrets beyond the reach of public awareness and authorities. Kenzo looked at the young man in front of him and asked, I was told you're the new S-Class Crow with the potential to reach SS. The young man sweated a bit and nodded, Yes, Crow Master, my mentor Viper has high expectations for my future in the organization. What do you think about my goal? Kenzo directed an intrigued look toward this young number one. After flicking the cigarette butt, he murmured, Crows are neutral, we have a different worldview, and we seldom bite. I'm intrigued by what you think. Number one thought for a moment and said, I have a friend who lived in District 11, she's human, and her family was killed by ghouls. When I found out, it was too late, but luckily, she survived. When I heard she was moving to District 20 because it's a safe area, I began to question if we ghouls are doing the right thing. Kenzo, 
known as the Crow Master and the Black Demon within his organization, had a fantastic vision of the world. Everything was functioning, but everyone knew that there was something more, waiting for them to become powerful enough to start expanding. Of course, now, with what happened to Kanaki, things could signify drastic changes that needed to be taken into account. In less than half an hour, they arrived at the hospital, and without getting out of the black car Kenzo was traveling in, he headed to the underground parking lot. You'll be my shadow from now on, just act as a guard and learn slowly. Kenzo put on a black crow mask and, wearing his all-black suit, donned leather gloves. Now, we're going to learn new things that you were unaware of until a few days ago. Chapter 21, The Crow Master When Kenzo stepped out of the car, he wore a black crow mask that covered his face. He had black gloves on his hands, and his body was completely concealed by a suit of the same color, hiding any trace of his skin. Greetings, Crow Master. The Second Order's crows, who were non-combatants, were responsible for protecting the official facilities according to their schedule and regulations. They did not engage in any activities that might compromise them, so there was no problem with them being involved in any suspicious activities. The hospital facilities were divided into three parts, public, private, and secret. Kenzo was currently heading to the secret areas in the company of Number One, who was following closely behind him. Kenzo looked at the exquisite decorations in the hospital, which was undeniably a beautiful place. As he walked down a long hallway, he glanced at an elevator and asked Number One, How is that boy named Kanaki doing? Number One pondered for a moment and replied, He's still in a coma, but he's alive. It's quite surprising that he could survive after receiving organs from a ghoul as a mere human. Kenzo had thought of this as both an advantage and a problem that he needed to pay close attention to. Firstly, if they started creating ghouls from humans, they would have the potential to create strong soldiers capable of matching ghouls, and that would be a significant disadvantage for their future plans. People like Kenzo mapped out their path from start to finish. There was no middle ground, they had to get from one point to another and resolve all the threats that stood in their way. Was there any collateral damage? Kenzo asked as they waited for the elevator to descend to the lower floors. Number one replied to Kenzo, there were no issues during the mission. No victims or witnesses, everything went smoothly, and there's no trace connecting the disappearances to us. That's perfect. The last thing I want is the police knocking on the hospital's door. I already have enough problems to deal with, and new issues keep popping up. After a few minutes, the elevator stopped, and a massive corridor opened before them with descending stairs further ahead. The facilities have expanded even more since the last time you were here, Crow Master. We've created more training grounds and production areas have increased after establishing a production facility for wine, sweets, and jelly. From Number One's words, he seemed genuinely excited to be able to enjoy these foods he had heard so much about from his friend, even though they always tasted like dirt when he tried them. His behavior was typical, all ghouls were very excited about their new products because they had a unique flavor that they could savor with their taste buds. Research was crucial for them to find more meaning in life, after all. Food should be enjoyed in the same way and never be envious of humans, as ghouls could achieve the same. This place always amazes me. Isn't it too vast and intimidating? Any human would wet their pants if they set foot in this place, although that's certainly impossible. Kenzo maintained a calm tone as number one, this time, led the way to the interrogation room. The security and presence of ghouls increased as they moved further into the facilities. In other words, there were hundreds of ghouls within a hundred meters in every direction, monitoring at all times. As one of the three major facilities, in addition to the other two locations, this place held many of the things that the Three-Eyed Crow organization valued. Walking through an incredibly vast area, they soon arrived at a cellar where Viper was inside, speaking with Dr. Kanu, who seemed unwilling to say a single word. Upon entering, Kenzo looked at the somewhat gruesome scene and asked, What is happening here? When everyone heard Kenzo's question, they looked at him for a few seconds before bowing, and Viper, who was in the lead, said, Master Crow, this is the doctor who created a ghoul through an organ transplant. Please, have a seat. I want you to be comfortable. Kenzo looked over at Dr. Kanu after walking towards a metal table with various specialized instruments. Please, there's no need to torture me. Dr. Kanu cried out while trembling, seeing Kenzo holding a long, thick needle. Kenzo smiled beneath his mask and said, Dr. Kanu, I actually had other plans for this evening with my partner, but the priority you've given me made me decide not to meet with her. Do you understand what you're doing? Let me explain the gravity of the situation. 
Right now, the CCG is gaining strength due to those fantastic weapons they create with Kaguns from killed ghouls. Now, what will happen if they have the ability to become ghouls and decide to create their private army? Viper, what would happen? Viper blinked a couple of times and said, Well, the war we thought would be less disastrous would reach very dangerous levels for the stability of society. If suddenly there are ghouls fighting for humans, we will face the difficulty of being much more forceful in this war we want to win with minimal effort and damage. Yes, well, that is an advantage of our own efforts to create a much better world with fewer monsters we know of. They've caused us a lot of trouble, shouldn't they be trembling with fear right now? Dr. Kanu asked, seemingly having gone mad. Kenzo walked over to Dr. Kanu and sat in front of him, sighing lightly at how tiresome this was. First of all, you need to know that I don't care at all about your inventions. I just need to know where they are made to blow that place to pieces. But, certainly, you would help me if you worked for me. Besides, I need to know why they targeted Misris in their objectives. What nonsense are you talking about? Dr. Kanu seemed agitated upon hearing this question. Come on, we know it all. Originally, she was the test subject in that experiment you conducted with Kanaki. But since we replaced the corpse in the end and took Riz, you had no choice but to use what you had at your disposal. Still, I'm curious, what does the V organization have to do with all of this? Shut up. What nonsense are you talking about? I don't know any organization by that name. I've always acted alone, Dr. Kanu shouted, clenching his teeth in anger. Well, I'll ask Riz later. But for now, you have the opportunity to gain influence if you cooperate. So tell me, what's the purpose of these experiments, how many are involved, and what does the V organization have to do with it? Kenzo stopped smiling, this topic was extremely critical, and he needed to do his best to get answers. Chapter 22, He is Incorrect I've never heard of the V organization. Why do you assume and ask those condescending questions when I have no relationship with them? Dr. Kanu couldn't recall ever coming across them, although he did have an open association with the Aojirai tree, he had never been involved with the V organization. Of course, Kenzo was unaware of this, which is why he personally conducted the interrogation. When he heard the response, his gaze turned even colder, and he thought to himself, so the V organization's goal has always been to kill Riz. It would make very little sense, but so far, there haven't been more ghouls in the 20th Ward who are part of external organizations. In that respect, perhaps he had been mistaken in what he had thought so far. I understand, then. Are you only conducting these insane experiments based on your own vision? Kenzo asked once more, relieved that he didn't have to resort to any kind of violence to get the answers he wanted. Dr. Kanu, with his cold and ruthless gaze, shifted in the metal chair and maintained a calm expression. As he looked at Kenzo with a subtle smile on his face, he began to explain his misanthropic impulses and perspective. Crow Master? That's what they call you, right? Have you ever wondered what truly drives humanity? Have you contemplated their place in the scheme of the universe? Intrigued by the question, Kenzo nodded cautiously while furrowing his brow. In my relentless pursuit of knowledge and power, I have come to see humanity as an inferior species. I consider them weak, condemned to an ephemeral existence and without potential, unlike ghouls who truly have significance for the future. Kenzo raised an eyebrow, starting to understand Dr. Kanu's nihilistic perspective. This old man definitely knows something, he wouldn't be so confident if not for that. But if he doesn't have the backing of the V organization, then who gives him that confidence? My hybrid experiments, the creation of beings that are a mix of humans and ghouls, are nothing more than a means to achieve my goals and satisfy my ambitions. I see these beings as mere stepping stones on the path to my greatness. Viper and the others frowned, perplexed by the lack of empathy and compassion in the doctor's words, but they continued to listen attentively. Humanity is trapped by its own limitations and weaknesses. Their emotions and morality are their shackles, preventing them from reaching their full potential. Ghouls, on the other hand, represent an evolution, a response to human stagnation. Dr. Kanu seemed completely convinced of his beliefs, showing no hint of doubt. Crow Master, understand that I feel no remorse for my actions. I am willing to sacrifice humanity for the sake of my vision. Ghouls are the future, the next stage of evolution. I see them as a superior species, one that is destined to replace humanity as we know it. Ha 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 ha. Midway through Dr. Kanu's absurd speech, Kenzo began to mock him sadistically, laughing at these words from his inferior perspective. Crow Master. 
Viper was puzzled by Kenzo's sudden actions, so he gave him a questioning look as if seeking some kind of explanation for his sudden laughter. At the end of the day, you're just like the average ghouls. You underestimate humans so much that it's no surprise you can be defeated even without my presence. What I always tell my crows is to be cautious of humans. I train them to eliminate CCG humans, as we consider them the greatest enemy of ghouls among organizations of our size. But very few understand this. Kenzo stated as he placed his hands behind his back and pointed, you are correct to say that humans are an inferior species compared to ghouls, which in essence makes us a superior race derived from humans. However, it would be incorrect to say that we are superior, my friend. Most ghouls in other districts are wretched misfits who don't know how to live civilized lives. Kenzo's tone was cold, his gaze beneath the mask devoid of emotion and remained intact. What is your point? Dr. Kanu asked hesitantly. I won't allow anyone to disrupt the world's balance with foolish experiments. Now, I'll give you two options. In the first, you become a part of the crows, live, and potentially fulfill part of your wish. In the second, regrettably, you die. Game over, Kenzo raised his hand, and a slow stream of blood began to spill around his body. I already have a deal with the Aojirai tree, Dr. Kanu, who seemed to be consumed, said these words with extreme difficulty, as if pressure were bearing down on him. What did you say? Kenzo asked in a cold tone. I have an agreement with the Aojirai tree. If you're a ghoul, you must have heard of this powerful organization. Your damn crows are no match for them. If they find out you did this, they will kill you. Just because we don't bite doesn't mean we're weak, you old fool. You don't come to me and act all cocky. Kenzo removed his gloves and slowly pressed Kanu's head. Ah! The increasingly agonizing scream made everyone slightly nervous. Witnessing the Crow Master act in this way was always very unsettling. The aura Kenzo unconsciously exuded terrified them all. Despite the chaos that was unfolding, Kenzo did not feel guilty or any human adrenaline rush. His breathing was normal, so such situations didn't affect him anymore. But just as he was about to kill Kanu, a voice beside him stopped him from doing so. Crow Master, we've been attacked, Viper looked at Dr. Kanu and spoke these words in a very low tone. Kenzo, who had stopped, asked, where and how many casualties? At the border of the 14th Ward, it's likely a rogue ghoul who entered the 20th Ward after doing that. What should we do? Viper showed no emotion in his voice. Announce alert level 2. It might be the V organization or some other people who want to play games. Track the enemies down and eliminate the problems, Kenzo replied as he put on his leather gloves. Yes, Crow Master. Just as Kenzo was about to leave the facility, a voice asked him, what should we do with this old man? Hmm. Kenzo seemed to think for a moment and then said, it seems he's not lying about his connection with the Aojirai tree. When we meet, I'll verify that information and make a decision. If he's a problem, keep him, but I prefer to keep him captive and prevent him from dying for now. As he rode back up in the elevator, Kenzo thought, hmm, it seems that I won't be able to control things now, after all. The V organization should focus their attention on Antiaku or my organization, so in that case, we should be prepared to take complete control of the 14th ward. But I also need to consider having an official meeting with the Aojirai tree. While walking back to the elevator, many machines were naturally moving human meat via conveyors installed in the floor. Each conveyor contained a ton of exquisitely prepared human flesh, and these were the monthly shipments for the ghouls who needed to be fed in the organization. Not far away, a couple of large facilities were responsible for producing emergency food, which was used in extreme cases when the regular shipments didn't arrive on the same day. It had never happened before, but Kenzo needed to have many contingency plans in case of an attack. When he entered the elevator, Viper pressed the button that would take them to the first floor and said, It's starting. Should we prepare as well? It appeared that Viper had already noticed his thoughts, so Kenzo said, We are invincible in the 20th ward, but we shouldn't show our teeth too often. Taking the 14th and 19th wards will be easy, and when we do, our dominion will expand by 200%. Dot. Kenzo removed his mask in disgust as he looked at the floor numbers and said, Negotiations will resolve our issues about taking control, but similar to the early days here in the 20th ward, we will have management problems until we adopt our system in that place. It is well known that the 20th ward is not managed the same way as other districts, powerful ghouls do not dominate through regions or zones, and everything is well taken care of by the Three-Eyed Crow organization, so the feeding of all ghouls is now a non-issue. 
however, this won't be the case for a while in the 19th ward, which would be somewhat chaotic. Moreover, by entering that territory, they will draw the attention of the other districts, and they will begin taking measures against them. This is why they need to be quick when consolidating their power. Kenzo furrowed his brow and said, we need to set up a meeting with the leader of Aojirai. The meeting place can be wherever they choose. What? Hearing those words, Viper's expression turned very grim, and he said, Crow Master, you must reconsider this situation, as they could set a trap for us, and we'd fall right into it. Oh, don't worry about small things. I still think I'm the strongest ghoul in the world. Kenzo entered the hospital director's room followed by Viper. Was that just a joke? Viper asked, somewhat confused. Of course, I have no delusions of grandeur. In this world, I could be buried by many enemies, my girlfriend could also bury me if I'm late tonight. By the way, Viper, do you know what women like? She's in her last year of high school. Don't give me that look, the age difference is less than five years. I think I should give her a gift. You have a lot of experience with women, what would you give someone? Kenzo walked to the desk and retrieved some dusty keys. He looked up and said, Well, although it wasn't a mistake, I feel that she'll be the woman of my life. Viper sweated coldly, Does the famous Crow Master have a split personality right now? Where did his feared Crow Master personality go? After thinking for a moment, he adjusted his breathing and said, My sister likes chocolates, considering she's a ghoul, perhaps you could give her special sweets. You have some good ideas, by the way, when does the betting season start? Our horse will win this time, I have faith. Crow Master, we always lose. Chapter 23, The Song of Darkness To assess the extent of the problem, Kenzo's first action was to withdraw the lower-ranking B-tier guards. From this point on, with the elevated threat alert, only A-tier ghoul groups would be on guard, and in most places, they would be under the surveillance of the organization's cameras. Of course, to accomplish many of these things, they would need to be cautious and inform the Antioca group about what had happened and what could happen. How is Riz? Kenzo, after finishing some important matters that were meant to be considered only by him, directed a question to Viper. She's fine, she eats a lot but she's fine, the only things she does are read, drink coffee, and go back to her room to sleep. Viper listed the standout aspects of that woman and told Kenzo that there was nothing out of the ordinary that he should be concerned about. At least in that regard, Kenzo didn't have any problems. While he wanted to talk to her about the reason the V organization was pursuing her, he believed it would be better to keep a low profile. For now, he shouldn't press the issue too much, as she might manipulate the information due to the importance he was giving to something that possibly shouldn't matter much to her. Oh, so she's using us until she fully recovers from her injuries and her captors lose track of her once again. Given that, you should keep security discreet. I want to see what she does in the coming days before deciding to visit her. Kenzo walked forward without looking back. During that time, Viper simply nodded without speaking unnecessary words. They walked without any problems through the hallways, and besides the large rooms, they met number one, who had gone to get Kenzo's chocolates. Is everything ready? Kenzo asked as he continued walking. Number one nodded and said, everything is in order, Crow Master. The prisoners will be placed under closed arrest, and for now, they won't interact with any of them. Perfect, take me home, and let's get this over with. By late evening, today, for reasons Kenzo could sense, the cafe closed early. As always, Kenzo didn't need to give any explanation for his whereabouts, and Tuka had stopped asking much less frequently, so she just returned to her room. Tuka had learned from the internet about a scandal at the CCG facilities, but she didn't pay much attention to it because it wasn't a ghoul attack. After Kenzo poured himself a self-made coffee with milk, he reached the rooftop balcony. Too many things had happened recently, and the figure of the V organization had been emerging slowly. After all these years, you still haven't let go of the hatred in your heart, boy. At that moment, manager Yashimura appeared behind Kenzo. Instead of hating you, father, I'd rather hate that organization that has caused you so much harm. I suppose I must eliminate them and then save my sister, who is in a very bad condition. Kenzo took a sip of his coffee, which had completely lost its sweet and fresh flavor. The V organization is much larger than you imagined and cannot be eliminated by the hatred of a single person. Even the peaceful Three-Eyed Crow organization will not get involved in dirty waters just for your desire for revenge. You must understand this now and stop me in time before you lose something valuable. 
Kuzan Yashimura's voice was soft, devoid of any emotion reflecting the tone of his words. After saying that, he took out a cigarette and lit it, which surprised Kenzo a bit. I don't know what you are looking for after keeping yourself in the dark for so long, but you shouldn't carry such heavy burdens alone. What you should be responsible for is living a normal life. You are the only one, besides your sister, with that gift, so make the most of it. The organization I belong to knows that I am your son. They respect the fact that you kept District 20 safe, but they also know that the security you maintained was as fragile as paper. That's why the Three-Eyed Crow organization was formed. They don't have to go looking for corpses at night, possibly finding nothing. They use more sophisticated methods to feed thousands of ghouls living in constant fear of not being able to survive the CCG's relentless hunting. Kenzo cast a compassionate glance at his father and said without any pain, You're not as strong as you used to be, father. You've missed the opportunity to truly make a difference, so let us create a real basis for negotiation with the humans. I'm tired of killing. As you say, it's not the same as when I was young. You are different from your sister, and you are aware of my daily pain, unable to protect your mother back then. Kyuzen Yashimura knew that this time it was his son's turn to embark on a bloody path against the V organization, and he couldn't prevent it, but at least he wouldn't do it alone, and he wasn't foolish. I'm different from you. In fact, I'm different from my sister and from any ghoul with aspirations to influence. I'll take it upon myself to show all the ghouls the true path they should follow if they don't want to perish in the impending Great War. Kenzo had stopped feeling intense hatred towards his father a long time ago, now, he just let it pass. First, we will take District 14, establish an unbreakable dominion as you allowed to happen in this place, and a new safe zone will be created for all those who wish to live in silence without bothering people. That is the organization's plan A. But if the humans attack us, plan B will be initiated, and that would only be in an extreme case. Kyuzen Yashimura looked at his son and noticed many changes in his gaze. He had allowed the influence of the Three-Eyed Crow organization to grow, as they swore they would bring about a much more sustainable peace in this place, so he accepted his son's involvement. There wasn't much he wanted to say to his son, simply to make sure he didn't make a mistake and to stay strong to help the weaker ones. Although his goal was very different and more ambitious, perhaps Kenzo was the key to allow both worlds to coexist in one without being disturbed. Maybe you can do it. The world your mother wishes for is one where we are not treated as monsters, and we don't attack the innocent. At least, you took the best of us in our last years. Tap tap. At this moment, they heard footsteps behind Kenzo. Hmm. Father and son looked back at the same time. Ahem, he's here, manager. Tuka appeared behind them with a box full of things. She had come to find Kenzo but hadn't expected the manager to be here. Oh, Tuka, you haven't slept yet. Manager Yashimura chuckled softly. I just came to bring Kenzo some food that my friend sent me. Tuka lifted the box filled with sweets and many other items in her hands. Upon hearing this, the store manager simply nodded. Here, you have it. Don't just eat the first thing you find and run off. Tuka blushed slightly and handed the box of sweets to Kenzo. Thank you, my dear Tuka. Kenzo took it without being pretentious. In this cafe, most of the customers are ghouls, so they only eat human flesh, and regular food doesn't exist. Although Kenzo consumes both types of meals, his diet is balanced to keep him strong. Although the store manager sometimes prepares breakfast, Kenzo often eats quickly because the wall with his father still existed. It was something he couldn't avoid and even though he always showed respect, it was now difficult to maintain a father-son relationship. Kenzo spent the first 13 years of his life in the home of his adoptive father, so being so close to a man who didn't exist back then felt strange. Moreover, everything he knew made it impossible to hide what he felt. Kenzo picked up some candies at random and started eating them. Why don't we open a restaurant in the future? The special food we prepare would become very famous among customers. Kenzo holding an anajiri in his hand, proposed something that seemed to come out of nowhere. Hey, are you joking? How is that even possible? Upon hearing this, took a laugh and patted Kenzo. That can also be considered. Store manager Yashimura said with a smile at that moment. In reality, it's impossible. I'm the only one with taste buds in this house. All that coffee has seared their tongues. Kenzo considered it more clearly. The store manager didn't speak. He just smiled without saying a word, then dropped the cigarette butt he was holding to the ground and extinguished it. Uh, store manager, when did you start smoking? 
Tuka only now realized that Kyuzen Yashimura was smoking. Oh, I just started today, but smoking is bad for my health. I'll try to smoke as little as possible. Manager Yashimura replied. Yes, it's bad for the body, though I doubt we'd have a problem. But it's bad for the cafe's image, you shouldn't pick up those bad influences from others. Tuka said, giving Kenzo a stern look. Well, I'll try. Store manager Yashimura smiled and nodded. I know where you're going with this, it won't happen, ha ha ha. Kenzo smiled faintly. Why are you laughing? Unsatisfied, Tuka gave Kenzo a cold look. Only those who can smoke will, those who no longer have lungs can't, and with a regeneration in our immune system, something like that wouldn't affect us in the least. Kenzo couldn't help but tease Tuka. Kyuzen Yashimura then thought, so, she knows. It seems their relationship has escalated a lot in the last few months. Chapter 24, What's Your Wish? Enjoy the candy in silence. When Tuka heard those final words from Kenzo, she felt very angry for always contradicting him in every situation he could. I'm going to rest, let's talk about something later, manager Yashimura said as he left. I'm going to bed too. After Kenzo saw his father leave, he ate the last piece of candy he had taken and wanted to go to the bathroom to brush his teeth. Tuka was surprised and wanted to call Kenzo to stop him, but in the end, she didn't know what to say, so she could only silently watch Kenzo's back as he walked to the bathroom. Is there something wrong with you today? Kenzo turned his head at this moment and couldn't help but ask since he couldn't read what Tuka was thinking at the moment. Uh, me. Tuka was left speechless for a moment. Oh, if everything's fine, I'll go brush my teeth. Kenzo said with a mischievous smile hidden on his face. Wait, Kenzo. Tuka called Kenzo to stop at this moment. Hmm. Kenzo stopped and looked at his little grumpy girlfriend. Can you go for a walk with me? Tuka hesitated for a moment and finally raised her head and said what she wanted to say, her face was also red because of this. Go for a walk? Sure, but between lovers, you can ask for more than just a walk. A motorcycle, a car, new clothes, whatever you want. By the way, I bought you something very valuable today, so you can open it later. Kenzo joked a bit and then remembered the special chocolates he had obtained, so he pointed to the black box on the table. Go to hell. Upon hearing this, Tuka blushed even more and was about to take a step forward to punch Kenzo. You're much slower than I expected, you should eat much more. Kenzo didn't even see the trajectory of the punch heading for his stomach, he avoided it and with an increase in speed, he appeared behind Tuka and held her gently by the waist. What? Don't you want to take a bite of me again? Kenzo whispered these last words into Tuka's ears. Tuka wanted to break free from this cocky grip, and suddenly, when she could turn around, she found herself wrapped in Kenzo's broad embrace. Now, what will you do to defeat me? Kenzo, who was still hugging Tuka, noticed her silence and asked, By the way, it's very late, is something bothering you? It seems you don't want to go out and just walk. Wait, do you want to go to a hotel? Stop saying embarrassing things. Tuka gave Kenzo a headbutt on the chin, and he fell onto the nearby bed but never let go of her. After wrestling for a while on the bed, Kenzo, who ended up winning, looked at Tuka, who had remained motionless. Kenzo, why do you run out every night and not come back until early in the morning? Tuka thought about it and finally asked what was bothering her. Upon hearing this, Kenzo said, It's nothing, I just like going out because it's nighttime. First of all, Kenzo didn't want to involve one of the few people who could genuinely worry him. Tuka is still a bit naive, and in situations of real danger, she might make poor choices. Involving her directly with the organization Three-Eyed Crow is something he can't do because it would completely expose his identity as the Crow Master. For now, and for a long time, he wants his human identity to be known only by a select few, as this would bring multiple benefits and prevent the authorities from openly investigating his businesses. Due to this major issue, he would never reveal his human identity as a ghoul. Not for now. There are many things in motion, and it would be a problem if his identity were exposed. Recently, many ghouls have been engaged in a bloody fight in District 20. Are you involved in that? Tuka put her feelings aside, looked at Kenzo, and asked him seriously about it. Um. Kenzo nodded without denying it. What is your goal in getting involved with that? Why are you doing this? Tuka asked again which was what she had wanted to ask for a long time. 
I want to create a world where ghouls don't have to hide and adapt to humans. I'm fighting for a world where humans and ghouls can create a new way of life. Kenzo looked into Tuka's eyes and then turned, lying down on the bed. I joined the Three-Eyed Crow organization when I was twelve. They trained me and shared their goal, which seemed very unrealistic at the time. But now, Tuka, we have a very high chance of achieving it, the same world you've dreamt of. Upon hearing Kenzo's response, Tuka's expression darkened immediately, and she clenched her teeth in anger. So why does it have to be you? Tuka asked, her eyes filled with heavy emotions. I'm strong, Tuka, so strong that I can achieve this impossible dream for thousands of ghouls. I know what you're thinking, but I'm not foolish, dying is not in my plans until I have many children. Kenzo smiled calmly as he spoke these words. Many children? You like kids? Tuka asked, surprised. That's a somewhat complicated question. I'd like to have many children when this world is adapted to protect them. Kenzo's large hand reached out to Tuka and pulled her to his side. In the past, Tuka would push Kenzo away for touching her so abruptly, but this time, she did nothing. I'm going to win, Tuka. Kenzo murmured as he thought about everything that was about to come. Then I'll help you. Tuka sat on Kenzo and looked into his eyes directly. Seeing this scene, Kenzo was surprised for a moment. But then he smiled slightly and said, You are my greatest support. Kenzo reached out and lightly touched Tuka's face, then pulled her toward his face. The moment their bodies pressed against each other, a kiss filled with passion and heavy feelings reached both of their lips. After a few seconds, Kenzo gently bit Tuka's tongue, which was slowly moving into his mouth. Oops. Tuka opened her eyes in surprise, looked at the idiot who had just bitten her, and she did the same but with more force on Kenzo's tongue. But when she felt the delicious blood merging with their kiss, she instinctively wanted to pull away because she also felt a mischievous hand moving around her waist. Tuka broke the kiss opened her eyes, and roared in embarrassment and annoyance, You bastard, I'm going to kill you. After that long kiss that left Tuka breathless, Kenzo laughed and walked towards the street, fulfilling Tuka's request at the moment, and they walked in silence together. Kenzo's incomprehensible behavior made Tuka very angry, he always made her blush. Soon, after chasing Kenzo for a while, Tuka found that the feeling of embarrassment was gradually fading. In reality, if we have a chance, we will initiate a plan for the organization I belong to to expand to another district. It will go on like this until all the districts are unified under one power, Kenzo walked ahead and confessed this secret to Tuka to put her at ease. Don't they move unless they believe they have a chance? Tuka, who was behind him, asked, puzzled. That's right. You know that organization is very peaceful and loves absolute control over their actions, so they wouldn't risk their people's lives so easily, Kenzo responded to Tuka indifferently. Don't you think they're hypocrites? Everyone talks about having a goal, but when it starts, no one cares about the lives that will be taken to achieve those goals, Tuka said disdainfully after hearing this. Oh, we're different. You just need to watch from the sidelines. What you think is normal, but don't assume we're the same as others, Kenzo didn't care what others thought, but he certainly didn't like it when Tuka misinterpreted him. Then let me accompany you. Tuka said with a smile. Kenzo looked at her and said, that needs to be considered. As the two walked, Kenzo stopped at the entrance of a convenience store. I'm going to buy a bottle of water, Kenzo said, entering the convenience store. It was unexpected for people to come shopping at this time of night, only those who didn't care about their own safety went out at night. Although nothing really happened in District 20. What was surprising was that these stores didn't have workers, as a customer, you paid for whatever you took, and then you left the store. Some of the people who came only bought condoms and mints, which made Kenzo buy them for fun and he glanced at Tuka, who was looking at some of the products on the shelves. Chapter 25, Whenever You Want After buying everything, Kenzo returned to Tuka. On the street, Kenzo took one of the snacks from the bag and ate it while walking. Tuka glanced at the delicious food Kenzo was enjoying and couldn't help but pout. We're genetically engineering food that ghouls can consume. For now, We've only succeeded with regular wines and chocolate, Kenzo took out a silver-wrapped chocolate bar and handed it to Tuka. Is it the same as the one you gave me? Tuka held the chocolate bar with trembling hands, and her eyes shone with excitement. Although ghouls can't eat regular human food, there are still a few things they can taste, like coffee and water. Anything more than that is simply impossible. Something other than liquids was impossible for a normal ghoul to eat, 
so Tuka didn't hesitate to unwrap the chocolate. Try it. Many have tried it and even cried from the excitement of experiencing new flavors, Kenzo said as he cut a small piece of chocolate and placed it in Tuka's mouth. This taste. Tuka couldn't help but tremble as she felt the flavor of the chocolate on her taste buds. She had never experienced that kind of taste with anything other than human flesh, so it only took one bite for her to cry unconsciously. Kenzo could only smile, he knew what this meant for any other ghoul who had been forced to eat to survive and hide from humans. Sometimes I envy humans a lot. They can taste all kinds of food. Tuka said after taking a bite of the chocolate. Just be envious, there's nothing wrong with that. Kenzo said as he stroked Tuka's hair. By the way, what does the thing you're trying taste like? Why do you like it so much? Tuka asked again at this moment. It's similar to chocolate, but this one has bread and tastes sweet and sour. The crumb is elastic and soft, contrasting with the crispy, thick crust of what I eat. It's not a big deal if you think about it, and we're very close to altering the genetics of food and creating a vaccine to stop the production of that substance that prevents ghouls from eating anything. Kenzo was excited about all the discoveries they could make in the future. Um. I've eaten bread, but I found the taste very hard to swallow. Tuka made a disgusted expression as she remembered the unpleasant taste of bread. Ghouls can't eat human food because they simply can't swallow it, and the worst part is they can't digest it. If a ghoul eats these foods for an extended period, it will cause severe damage, leading in the worst case to death. However, to integrate into human life, sometimes Tuka eats some human food in front of her human friends. The manager Yashimura does the same. Like silly internet challenges, such as eating a lemon without making any expressions, Kenzo, with a natural expression, asked his father to eat a piece of a sandwich without showing any expressions. Due to the sudden declaration, he stated that if he couldn't do it, he would ask someone else. That day, he was not only punched by Tuka but also by Enji. The best thing he could do that day was to leave the cafe for a while. Oh, by the way, a very good meat pie will be made soon. It's still in beta testing because the side effects are unknown, but if it's successful, I'll invite you to eat it, Kenzo said casually, but behind his words was an implication that only Tuka understood. Oh. At this moment, a girl on the side of the road caught Kenzo's attention. Well, isn't this girl from our school? What is she doing on the street so late? Tuka wondered, slightly confused. I heard her father had an accident at work, he was hospitalized and needed money, so she went to work. Kenzo said casually, even though he hadn't been to school in a while, he was well informed about where Tuka studied because he had always tried to look out for her. Tuka stopped and looked at the girl. What's wrong with you? Come on, don't get involved in other people's problems. Kenzo said, completely disinterested. Kenzo, help her. Tuka couldn't help but want to help the girl. Oh, I don't have extra money to help her, so let's go, don't pretend to be a good person. Kenzo's last desire was to have the gratitude of a girl who might become annoying later. However, Tuka pulled Kenzo and approached. Hey, you really are stubborn. Kenzo scratched his head wearily. Tuka. And your friend who dropped out of high school. The street girl was obviously surprised when she saw the two of them. What are you doing out here at this hour? It's a very lonely area, so I can't help but ask after feeling Tuka's hand pressing on me, Kenzo asked after hearing this. Upon hearing this, the girl hesitated and ultimately didn't dare to speak. In her hands, she held a sign, and when she realized they were acquaintances in front of her, she turned around. Kenzo frowned, reached out, and looked at the sign. You can kiss me for only 1,300 yen. Is that so? I'm sure many would consider this the impossible dream of a night. Kenzo, with his tired expression, fell silent. Tuka was also surprised but didn't judge the girl for it. On the contrary, she respected this girl a lot because she knew that she was doing everything for her father who was hospitalized. As many say, laughing at the poor and not laughing at prostitution is just hypocrisy. You should go back home there have been ghoul attacks nearby recently. Kenzo took the sign from the girl's hand. Oh, took his friend, give it back to me. The girl was startled and tried to retrieve her sign. You should take care of yourself, if something happens to you, your father would never forgive himself. Kenzo said nothing. After returning the sign to the girl, he turned and left. Hey, we should help her. But at that moment, Tuka stopped Kenzo. Do you really want to do that? 
Kenzo was slightly annoyed by Tuka's attitude, she needed to learn to distinguish between empathy and pity. Lately, I've lost a lot in gambling. Kenzo thought about the money he had lost from gambling, and it only infuriated him more. You had told me that you would do whatever I asked. Tuka seemed unwilling to back down from this request. Kenzo looked at Tuka. Even though this woman generally tended to be grumpy, she liked being a good person, and she did it without even realizing it. It's not that Kenzo didn't want to help, he was already helping people too much, so he couldn't care less about others when he was out and about. Thinking about this, Kenzo touched the not-so-thick wallet in his pocket and then looked at the girl's sign, which read, You can kiss me for only 1,000 yen. Even if only 1,000 yen was given, it was estimated that the girl's father's hospitalization fee wasn't that high. But still, Kenzo stopped caring and took out all the bills from his wallet, which amounted to around 100,000 yen, and said, Hey, girl, do you think I can use my tongue for 100,000 yen? What? Tuka was frozen in place, hearing Kenzo's question so suddenly. Isn't he your boyfriend? The girl looked at Tuka in fear. Thanks for listening.